Hello, hello, welcome, welcome. It is a rainy day here in Taipei, Taiwan, and uh, we are chatting about all sorts of things. Um, I wanted to start off today talking about uh, Storm of Swords, which Storm of Swords is mo usually when I talk to people, most people think Storm of Swords is the best one. It's usually people's either their favorite one or their second favorite one. I would say it's it's the fan faves, right? Everyone loves Storm. And 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 Storm has the strength of having a very nice pace for most of the book, especially the ending. It kind of builds up into crescendo of excitement. Um but the uh you know, you, we've got great events like the attack at the fist of the first men and the crest crasters keep mutiny and battle at castle black and the red wedding and lice's death and escaping the whites with cold hands and stoneheart's resurrection um and Tyrion's trial it's just uh excitement after excitement after excitement um however it is not a flawless book and uh it's was written very very fast so a uh, uh, game of thrones george r martin released in 96 but you know he had he had thoughts about it in 92 and started writing in earnest around 94 and so he there were there was many years going into that first book and clash of kings even though it came out only two years later keep in mind about half of the clash of kings was already done when a storm of swords i mean uh when when a game of thrones was published so the um the book that was done almost just crazily fast is was a storm of swords um you know george pumping it out in you know just two years and it's a big book and i've been thinking a lot about like george when he's rushed and um what he produces and and if you've been watching my over analyzing house of the dragon you kind of know that like the rogue prince was a very rushed product and um, the ending kind of just falls apart. It absolutely falls apart. Um, and so I was thinking about A Storm of Swords because this was a this is a very rushed book and yet it comes out in many ways very, very good. But then there's also some problems with it. And so I wanted to talk about some of the few things that like, and this, this is in somewhat ascending order of seriousness but not necessarily this isn't like a pure ranking i didn't think about like eight over seven but um so the first thing i don't know if it'd be helpful to put a put and maybe people can add other things that they think are are kind of weird about storm um Uh, so the first thing that I think is a very weird thing is the Brienne's fight with the boat. Okay. So if you guys remember at the beginning of A Storm of Swords, we're, we're getting introduced to um, Brienne's, Brienne and Jamie's relationship. And they're riding this boat down the trident. And at some point they're being pursued. And Brienne jumps out of her boat, climbs up a mountain, pushes a boulder off of a mountain. It rolls down the mountain and lands on the opposing ship. And then she runs and gets back in her ship with Jamie. And it's pretty, it's beyond cartoonish. I don't know. I can't think of anything else in a store in the whole series that is, kind of that cartoonish in in its action um and so i kind of think it's a it's it's a it's a poorly planned like it's you know it's not like that isn't written well or things like that but come on like someone jumping out of their boat and climbing up a mountain and pushing a boulder off of a mountain and having that boulder land on a ship is just kind of ridiculous <laughs> you know um so Let's just say that I can't think of anything else that that's that, that just that cartoonish. Um, if anybody else has any ideas or, or thinks that's somewhat realistic, but it's it's um, it's 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 just insane. All right. So the next thing that 
I think is a bit weird. Let's see here. Um, and I've written about this. Um, and maybe there is, this one is perhaps fixable if you think there's a kind of theory about it. But if you think there's some scheming on, on there, but keep in mind this, this like, you have to believe in like crazy theories and mind control at this point, like I do in order for all of this to make sense. But the hunger at Craster's Keep is, um, makes no sense uh, in the situation. And now people are getting hungry and complaining that Craster isn't giving them enough food and, and wanting like hard sausages from the cellar when there's literally a horse being cooked in front of them. And they're like handing out like horse steaks to everybody and everybody's sitting there going, Oh, I wish I had a hard sausage. And then they get into a fight. Now that now, now maybe there's mind control going on, but you'd think that like, is every single person in Craster's keep mind controlled? Like there's not a single person that's like, dude, shut up. Like we've got steak right here. You're hungry. Here's a fucking horse steak. So in order for the scene to kind of like work, you need every single person in Craster's Keep to, to be mind controlled. Now keep, keep in mind, like I did a video on this and, and it does seem like there's some mind control going on, but like some mind control is, is like a little different than like every single person completely forgetting that there's a freaking horse like being cooked right there. Um, you know, like, including we're in Sam's mind. Like, Sam wasn't like, um, excuse me, guys, have some horse. Like, that's just never fucking, like. So, uh, you know, so that that I think is a little a little sloppy on, on, on George's part. The next one, I think this is pretty famous, and I, most people agree with this, um, is Danny getting her army. Um, let's keep in mind that no merchant would be, especially one who deals in like military sales and deals with all sorts of like crazy evil characters would be so careless as to hand over the rights to an entire army that can then be used to kill them while simply like grabbing a dragon like on a on a rope and i understand that people are like oh they were super arrogant and stuff like that no one's that no one's that dumb like just no one's that dumb like imagine you're like a gun merchant and you know someone agrees like some sketchy dudes come into town and want to buy like all of your weapons and you just like meet them in an alley and you hand over all of your weapons and they hand over like all like the money You'd be like, how am I going to protect myself? Like, that's the first thing on your on your mind. Like, it's now it's and what's odd is it's supposed to be seen as like clever. And, and obviously the plot demands that are that that Danny gets her army. But there's there's just no way that any human being would be that stupid. Like in real life. And I think most people kind of kind of admit that, like, this is a little forced like Danny. Danny getting her army as great as the scene is and everyone loves the scene and how exciting it is and, and, and stuff like that. But logically speaking, like, come on, come on. Um, <laughs> I've eaten a horse. It's fine. It's, it's, I've had plenty of horse. It's, uh, and I've had zebra. So I've actually had Zorse too. Um, Zorse is actually tastier than, than horse. Um, by the way, but, uh, in my opinion, but I might've had different cuts and stuff like that. So I don't know anyway, but, um, but how do they taste? They taste more or less like steak, a little gamier, a little gamier than steak. Um, a little tougher, but for the most part, like steak, like if we're in the world of like, does it taste like chicken? Does it taste like pork? Does it taste like steak? It tastes like steak. All right. The next thing that's kind of sloppy about, um, uh, the, the series is um, is the timing of King's dying and Stannis. If you go through the story 
and you try to figure out like when Rob is dying and when and when Balon is dying and when Joffrey is dying and when that news is making it to Stannis and how Stannis is going to get to the wall so fast and all of that information and the deal with Edric Storm. It's it's impossibly fast. And like George, George tries to fix this a little in a dance with dragons by having Davos remember like incredible wins that push them fa- like fast and everything. But really, it's just kind of a failure on 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 a timing on a timing sense. Like it it really doesn't make sense if you look back at the at the at the timeline of everything and how things are going. Like it just it's just impossible. Um, but th- again, these are that's this one's kind of kind of minor. But let's see. And then another one. Let's go with, uh, let's do one more. And then I'll, I'll, I'll deal with some super chats and then come back to, to, my, to my, next, uh, my next five. Um, ah. And here we go. The Brave Companions logic for switching sides and taking Jamie's hand. Keep in mind that this problem is one of the reasons I like started theorizing and started my channel in the first place. I mean, it gets into the Dornish Ma- like creating the Dornish master plan to try to fix this plot hole. But if you go back and like try to figure out like what were the brave companions thinking and going into Roose, Roose Bolton's explanation to Jamie at their dinner, which is a page long expo- like convoluted explanation. It is the, the worst thing to read. <laughs> it's, it's so ridiculous. Bruce Bolton's like, do you know why, you know, Vargo Hote took your hand? And Jamie's like, cause he's insane. And he's like, no. And he goes on the worst, the worst, most convoluted explanation that makes no sense. And when you think of like the brave companions, like they were, they were given Heron Hall, and that was their reason for switching sides. Like a bunch of cell swords want to become feudal lords. Like all of them. Like the entire company was like, "Yes, I want to be farmer in the middle of the Riverlands." After like betraying, um, after cutting off like the 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 Lannisters' hand, the the L- Lannisters' son's hand, but then switching to his side, and then somehow like taking power it is the worst it makes no sense go back if you like and try to make sense of Bruce Bolton's words to Jamie and like why the brave companions switch sides it's so bad that this is one of the reasons I had it was just like no they had to there had to be some like other crazy reason or something some grander conspiracy to explain it all because no one no one would be this dumb like no one would like be like yes I'm gonna become a feudal lord like and and all of these agreements are going to be honored. Um, it's 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 just silly. Um, okay, let me answer a few a few super chats and I'll I'll get back. Um, have you ever read any Thomas Harris? The Hannibal books are a lot better than any of the adaptations. Yeah, you know I I actually have. Um, I read I read a bit of of Hannibal, um, and and Silence of the Lambs. I never read Red Dragon. Um. It's not, he's, he's a very, he's a very good writer and, and, and it's, it's gripping stuff. I didn't like, I mean, obviously I didn't like where Hannibal went at the end. I thought the <clears throat> ending of Hannibal was, was really like, I mean, I, I granted it's supposed to be creepy and unsettling, but it was so creepy and unsettling. Jodie Foster didn't want to be in the sequel, <laughs> of the adaptation, which is kind of funny. And then they changed it for Jodie Foster, but then there was a, a scheduling conflict. Um, cause I don't know. I, I don't know if I want to spoil it all for people, but like, uh, it, you know, it's, it's the, the, the book ending of the, of the Hannibal, the Hannibal trilogy is just really weird, really weird. Um, I don't know. Is this, this, this idea of like trying to make him uh, into this like gentleman thing. Um, and there's a lot of like, it's the same with like Frasier and I'm, I'm comparing Frasier and Hannibal, how like every man, view gentlemen is really weird um keep in mind my mother like uh was was in the symphony chorus in in her cities and like was hanging around with like all sorts of like you know music snobs and and stuff like this so it's like 
it's not that I don't understand what supposed like gentlemen, high society people or people that think they're artsy, like, and, um, like act like, and they don't act like Hannibal. Like they're, you know, and everyone's not sitting around like, um, you know, being food snobbies at the same time as talking about symphonies and stuff like that. It's, it's all that kind of took me out of it, but he's a fucking fantastic writer. I mean, the way he describes scenes and stuff is, is, is insane. And it's a very well-paced book. Um, um, Fagon has to die of grayscale. The, uh, I don't know. It's ca- it's crossed my mind because it's just such a brutal thing for, for like John Connington to view Aegon getting grayscale in front of him. That's like the most painful thing in the world. Um, uh, you know, that he's done all of this his entire life for this cause for, you know, his son or the, 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 stand in for the man he's in love with Rhaegar and and then to to actually get to the point where like he's responsible for giving him grayscale and having the boy die would be the worst most painful thing which is almost like oh god does it have to happen uh it's very george so you know it, it's certainly it's just one of those things like what's the worst most painful thing and you're like oh that would be it so it's something i definitely have like thought about like how how horrible like what a gut punch to to poor john con that would be um uh are you fan of fast paced or slow paced books i'm a fan of of contrast so i think i'm a fan of um of like building up and have like savoring those 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 tense moments it's not like i can't enjoy slow stuff that's slow there's you know like i said i think last week i praised the movie um halloween which is a very slow movie but it's like perfect because they're able to like be tense so it's not that i don't like slow stuff i do i do um but i think a lot of people like all excitement all the time i think i'd rather have like a nice building crescendo um that's well paced i mean that's what we say when we say well paced you know like um it's got the right down times and the right up times and stuff like that um it's one of my big problems with like actually thinking about the the fanfic um in order for it to go in order for, to get everything done every chapter has to be like epic and all this stuff needs to happen in order to close all of George's plots and which leaves very little like breathing room it's just like boom this happens boom this happens boom this happens and so it's it's uh it's uh yeah it's it's hard it's hard um George seems to be inserting new themes in each book through new point of views, setting aside how crowded the story already is. Do you think there are any other themes, ideas that he might add into wins? Um I hope not. I don't think like I was saying in the previous thing, is is there's just not a much that much time. You know, in a few months, um you know, when the, when the, when the fanfic gets to a, a, a certain person, keep in mind, keep in mind the fanfic right now represents about 25% of, of what the, the, um, final book would look like in size. And, you know, I, I think maybe at like the third point, uh, you know, I'd do it, I'd do a video about like what it means having going through and trying to close, close plot lines and resolve stuff. And you kind of realize that, Man, just closing um, all of the cliffhangers that George left us with takes half the fucking book. Half the book. And so, you know, and I'm talking like Battle of Blood, Battle of Ice, you know, Battle of Battle of Fire, Battle, Battle of Steel, like Cersei's trial, um, you know, Hota dealing with with uh Dark Star. Um, it's, it's, it's so, and then Danny and the Dothraki Sea, it's just like nonstop, like action. And then, oh, I mean, Lady Stoneheart, dealing with Lady Stoneheart, stuff like that. Just getting to the point where where you're resolving all of those cliffhangers, you know, essentially you're pushing act three of A Dance with Dragons to the, to the Winds of Winter. And then act three, 
is this bloated huge thing that's half the book. So what do you do at the second half? You know, at that point, you're just gearing up and trying to put all your pl- pieces in place for for A Dream of Spring, which, you know, at that point, you're, I mean, you have to somehow figure out some sort of little climax at the end, but it's just weird. It's very, very weird. I don't think any new themes will be introduced because it's hard to introduce new themes when there's just like nothing but action going on. But, um, you know, the general, the general themes are already there about, about, uh, you know, choosing your moral code and, and, and war being bad and, and the system, the system of, of marriage and sexism and, and everything like creating horribleness and being connected to war and stuff like that. Um, all right, one more, and then I'll go back to the, uh, the, uh, storm of swords. The watch is full of bad people and Craster is a douche. They're starving in the cold, led by Gior, who has marched them into a trap. Loyalty has its limits. Uh, it's not that, you know, it doesn't. It's just really freaking weird that everyone, like, like they're all sitting there reminiscing about how great, like, hard sausage is. When, like, we all know that the hard sausage is, like, you tear into it and you're like, rah, rah, rah. like, at that moment, you'd never think like oh that's the thing i'm hungering for you know (laughs) like when there's steak when there's horse steak right there um but yeah um and then uh and then a storm of swords is great but brand sections drag too much too much travel um yeah and then we and then we doubled we tripled down on that later but keep in mind aria stuff is also all travel um and then Jamie and Brienne is all travel in that too. Uh, and then I'm trying to think like um, who else is in that? I guess Tyrion sits in one place. Sansa sits in one place. John is traveling for a lot of it, but it's more exciting because he's like climbing a wall and getting into spats with, with Egret and stuff. But um, it's uh, yeah, the brand the brand is supposed to be the downtime right he doesn't nothing gets good with brand until the very last chapter when he's at the dread fort i mean you know i suppose there's the uh he almost gets caught by the wildlings that's a tense moment when they're in you know queen's crown tower okay so let's get back to weird things that involved with uh with a storm of swords um the next one i have on here is um Oberyn's logic I think Oberyn's and this is another one another reason like why like the Dornish master plan came came around and things like that and um would Oberyn really like you know he goes in with this idea that they're going to crown Marcella with Dornish law and then he's going to try to kill the mountain. Um, but like, you know, was this his plan the entire time to kill the mountain? Cause you know, it, it, like they try, like a feast for crows tries to put purpose and logic into what Oberon was doing, but it, it Oberon just seems very like it, as storm of swords itself it's just very rash and i don't know if a feast for crows or dance with dragons really um pieces it all together i tried to do it with the dornish master plan but by itself like think about george just writing like well Oberon just got angry and so he decided to defend Tyrion. well that's very lucky for our main character that Oberon like stepped in you know, very convenient, but does it really make sense? You know, does it really make sense that that Oberyn, this guy who is like a poisoner, who's been just, who's going to sit on the small council, who has all sorts of opportunity to to kill people off and and poison them at different times, would he like go on this very dangerous um, like duel with the mountain, or did he really feel for for Tyrion's cause? Did he really feel bad for that little? That little dwarf um, baby that 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 Cersei was twisting the penis of and things like that. You know, is it supposed to be read like that? Um, it's there. You know, there's some beautiful dialogue with the with the Oberyn Tyrion stuff, but overall, like, you know, 
you really struggle. You really struggle to like make sense of what he was trying to do, especially considering like in retrospect later, George is like, no, it was all part of some sort of plan. I haven't told you what the plan is, but it's some sort of plan. So, I mean, uh, Dornish master plan, like my idea tried to make sense of it all, but I don't know. Does, does, does George really, really know what he's doing there? Okay. So next that my problem with, uh, with um, Storm is Rorg and Biter's Rise. <laughs> so keep in mind, Rorg and Biter are some random dudes. And then all of a sudden, out of freaking nowhere... They, because they're like at the end of a clash of Kings, they're just like, are you guys brave companions? And they're like, we are now. And they're not just rank and file brave companions. Rorg is a sergeant all of a sudden. Like out of freaking nowhere. Did he like sign a contract? Did he like sit down with Vargo Hote? And you know, this is Rorg and Biter, like practically feral animals like these guys are like even on brave companion like level like why would you why would you trust these guys and the fir- and then the first thing that roar does um is try to like uh rape brianne which is like their valuable hostage and stuff like that it's just some over the top like why would a sellsword company take on just these random feral animals and then not just take them on as like rank and file, but make Rorg into like a sergeant. And then at the end, like he's leading a group of a a faction of the brave companions at the end. Like what, in what world is this? Like, is this happening? Like, why would anyone do that? Like it. And I, I understand why George did it. He's just trying to like shove in characters and have them fit together. And, and, um, you know, not have splitting plot lines too much, but there's no reason that Rorg and Butter should be rising in the Brave Companions. Um, and then let's do another, let's see. <laughs> All right. The next thing about how sloppy Storm is, Olina's murder scheme. <laughs> People, people love the Purple Wedding, but we kind of all know that the Queen of Thorns murder scheme is the, like, one of the most illogical things in the world. Like, I'm going to hire Littlefinger to hire a drunk to use a uh, 14-year-old girl to place some poison in her in her hairnet. Then, then I can go back and grab the hairnet and poison and then poison Joffrey. Like, why didn't you just keep it in your pocket? Like, or, or like, why do you need or, or have your own hairnet? Like, there's no reason to involve <laughs> Dantos and Sansa. There's none. There's no, in fact, there's no reason to involve Littlefinger. Like, if you want to freaking kill the king, just bring in the strangler yourself. Like, bring in one little small crystal and poison his wine. There's no reason to hire Littlefinger, to hire Dantos, to have Sansa, like, bring it in. People are like, well, if they get caught, they have an alibi. No. Oh, my God. Like, there's so many things that could go wrong, especially when you have Dantos being a freaking drunk. Like, what if he turns you in? What if Sansa doesn't wear the hairnet? Like, she's a little, she's, she's a little girl. <laughs> like, why would you do that? It's the dumbest. It's the dumbest dumbest thing now we're getting to the things that really like don't make sense about um which again like produces this whole video like video of mine that maybe alina didn't do it because that makes no freaking sense it makes no freaking sense um and then we've got the last two number two here these are some bad ones (sighs) joffrey Hired the cat's paw. <sighs> Come on. <laughs> like, like, in order for it to even work out, Tyrion misquotes Joffrey. Like, Joffrey in a Game of Thrones says, a dog, a dog to kill a dog. And 
Tyrion changes it to a dog to kill a wolf. Like he has to even like fake his memories to like shift it around. He's trying to impress his dad by like killing off a like he's trying to he's trying to impress his dad by being merciful, but Tyrion believes it's Joffrey because only Joffrey could be that cruel, but is he's trying to do an act of mercy, not cruelty. It's it's one of the most convoluted weird things. And it's one thing, okay, okay, maybe maybe Joffrey didn't hire the cat's paw. That's fine. Maybe Joffrey didn't hire the cat's paw. Um and somebody else did. However, both Tyrion and uh Jamie independently come to the conclusion that Joffrey hired the cat's paw. That by itself, like, you know, either they both like irrationally came to this conclusion or they both irrationally came to a wrong conclusion, the same wrong conclusion. Like either way, it doesn't really work. It doesn't, I mean, I think it's a better story if Joffrey didn't hire the cat's ball, but still it's really weird that Tyrion and Jamie would come to that conclusion, that ridiculous conclusion. Um, this is one overwhelmingly, I think fans recognize that Joffrey hired the cat's ball as a really stupid plot point. I don't think uh, there's not too many, too much argument on this. And then my number one thing that, and I think I think I've thought I thought about this for a bit, and I think this is the, the fundamentally the worst aspect of a storm of swords. The biggest mess up is the dream for spring. The Dream for Spring, I think, is the dumbest um, retcon in the entire book series. Um, and the reason is, is that it so fundamentally betrays the motivation of John, which who is a major character. <laughs> like, um, so the Dream for Spring is the idea that Ned wanted to let wildlings through the wall and um and become citizens or become subjects on the gift and new gift um and that he would have a bunch of like lords to oversee them and john was going to become one of these lords which so fundamentally goes against like the entire premise of the book. Like John begins the story thinking he has no future and therefore he's going to join the Night's Watch. Now, yes, in my theories, I'm like, well, this makes no sense. So maybe John, maybe like Ghost was messing with his brain. Okay. But that really only goes so far in explaining John's decisions. Every other person at Winterfell would be like, why are you doing that? You're going to be a Lord later on in life. It, it, it is such a crushingly bad decision. And it's also like done for no reason. Like it's one thing, like all these other things, all these other bad decisions in, in A Storm of Swords, like Brienne's fight with the boat. Well, I understand you needed an exciting scene where you wanted to establish Brienne as a, as a badass. Craster's hungry. Well, uh, uh, the hunger. Well, you, you wanted a mutiny. The mutiny is essential because you got to kill off Gior and stuff like that. You got to have, you you know, Danny getting her army. You need Danny to get that army. I understand why you forced it. The timing, you know, yes, you needed all those, those people to die and you needed to put Stannis on the wall. You're pushing your pawns in the right place. The Brave Companions. This one was not as necessary, but I understand that you're like, you've got too many plot lines and too many plot threads. Let's merge Rorg and Biter with, with the Brave Companions. Oberyn's logic. I, you know, you needed Tyrion to survive somehow. You needed Oberyn to do that. You needed the the, the uprising of Dorne later in the next book. Oh, I'm sorry. The the brave companions switching switching sides and Rorgan fighter. Like, you needed you needed all that. You you wanted Jamie to lose his hand. All these sorts of stuff. You just you you forcing these pieces. Alina murder scheme. You know, you wanted that murder scheme. You wanted some clever reason. You know, the Tyrion, the Littlefinger, clever reason that Littlefinger is going to explain things to to Sansa. Joffrey hired the cat's ball. You, you've had this lingering mystery. You wanted to surprise people. I get it. The dream for spring. It was for nothing. Like the only explanation is that like is, is for there maybe for there to be a tower 
for for Bran to hide in or something, you know, for that for that scene. But you could have had the tower otherwise. There was no need to come up with this like convoluted like plan that Nat Ned had to bring to bring uh, wildlings through the wall that completely betrays the entire premise of your character. Like John is a bastard, insecure about being a bastard, joins the Night's Watch because he has no opportunity. Oh, actually, you were going to be a fucking lord. <laughs> well, let's fucking. So that's it. That was, that's my, let's see. Let's see if people, <laughs> what else we have here? Um, who's your favorite Frey? For me, it's Walder and Cleos. Cleos is pretty awesome. I do really love Cleos. He is, he's a great, he is a, uh, he's, despite the fact that George wants him to be unlikable or something, he's a great, he's a great um, mediator. He's, he's, He's very relatable and likable to me, even though he's like, let's get a, let's get a nice bed tonight. You know, you're like, yeah, of course. Like fucking Cleo's Frey is great. Um, uh, I, I, I like Walder too. I like, um, I mean, I'm talking about original Walder. That I don't really like, um, I don't like bigger little Walder. Um, I like, uh, I like Gatehouse Amy. Um, um, I'm a fan of, uh, let's see who else is, is, uh, not many stick out, you know? So I guess I like gatehouse. I like, I like gatehouse Amy. Um, I mean, the other ones that stick out are like fat Walda. She doesn't actually have that many lines. Um, you feel, I feel sympathy for merit, poor merit, just cause you get a whole carrot, you get a whole chapter, but you know, he has, he has, he has a, he has an ass, but, um, I love Gatehouse Amy. She's she's great. Um, do you think A Dance with Dragons could have been split into two, two books? One about the North and the other about Essos. More space to include Battle of Ice and Fire. I think at that point, um, because A Dance with Dragons was already split in two, like George didn't want to do that. Um, and to be honest, like... When I think about those books, um, George, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of killing time in A Dance with Dragons with his main characters. And he, he felt like he needed to fill up a full book, you know, like we didn't need all of those Tyrion chapters. We didn't need all of those John chapters. We didn't need all of those Danny chapters, but he felt seemingly obligated to like write a bunch about them and fill up the book. Um, you know, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe a feast for crows should have never been split. You know, um, he could have probably removed a couple Cersei chapters, and um, but he would have still ended up with that same, um, that same uh, cliffhanger point. There's no way he would have been able to advance the story, right? So I guess I'm trying to think of like the ways to, 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 to not have. I think he should have shortened John, Danny, and Tyrion, and then and then dealt with the battles or something. Um, you know, that would have that would have been the solution. But instead, he just kind of like wrote a bunch to fill, and then and then got this cliffhanger and stopped. Which um, I don't know. I mean, he probably should have split the Winds of Winter up too, but. What you, what's you gonna do? What's you gonna do at this point? How to how to fix a dance with dragons? It's just he had he had so many cliffhangers hitting at the same point that what are you gonna do? Um, maybe he should have had at least one, you know, maybe at least just resolve the battle of fire or something, um, or the you know before before moving on. Um, but yeah, he he didn't need that many Tyrion, John, and Danny chapters. He could have cut those back. Um. Isn't the point of Oberon about how revenge clouds someone someone's mind? The the hole you dig two graves and one is for yourself and the other when you seek vengeance. Um It's uh So there's definitely this idea of of George's playing around and uh for a while in all of the books about the difference between justice and the difference between like revenge and justice, you know, 
So Oberyn comes to town wanting justice. And, you know, if you, if you, if you really kind of like, I understand like the hatred for the mountain, but you know, you're getting to the point where, you know, he, I guess he, he wants to implicate Tywin somehow so that Tywin will have his justice. Like the way to, the way to sort of like see logic in it is, is that like, okay, Tyrion is another piece of, of, of. Tyrion's kindred in the sense that Tywin is this person abusing the world and he's abused the world through the mountain and he's abused Tyrion. And so Oberyn is trying to achieve justice all at once, like saving Tyrion while implicating uh, Tywin while, you know, um, while showing the world and things like that. But then he's also already, well, maybe he's probably already poisoned Tywin. So it kind of doesn't matter to implicate him. But if we assume that Tywin wasn't poisoned, but uh, he doesn't, you know, it's it's just one of these weird things. Like, was the, was the mountain really going to scream out? Like, because it's in the show that he screams that he's, he, they try to correct it a little. And in the show, he's like, um, Oberyn says, um, who who gave you the order and things like that? But that's not in the book. Um, in the book, it's just uh, let's try to get this. You know, Oberyn in the in the book, he's just screaming over and over. You raped her. You murdered her. You killed her children. You know. Um. And so, yeah, like he confesses, like the mountain confesses at the end, but I don't understand what the point of the confession was. Because, okay, say he confesses, that doesn't really bring justice or revenge for Tywin. Now you could say, well, okay, okay, maybe Tywin was already poisoned, but if that were the case, then why not just stick around and poison the mountain later? Like that wouldn't be that hard. Um... It's all, it's all, it's all a bit weird, like trying to make sense of it all, which is why, like, I have this, like, convoluted, like, Dornish master plan, like, to try to make sense of it all, right? Like, if you're, if you were a poisoner and you're, and you've already poisoned one guy, why not poison both of them? And if you're trying to get, like, public implication, why only focus on one person and not the other? Why split it up? Ah, uh, things to, I mean, in the end, it's just kind of like, you, we needed Tyrion to survive somehow, right? You needed Tyrion to survive somehow. <laughs> Should I ask a guy from Annapolis for a date? Uh, Naptown? Um, uh, I mean, uh. I guess, you know, the, the, uh, um, I, you know, Naptown's filled, uh, he's from Annapolis. Um, I guess he might take you out on a boat. I don't know. I mean, obviously there's, there's going to be good people and there's going to be bad, bad people. And, uh, so I, I can't say, can't be like, oh yeah, you should do it. Um, but, uh, but, um, you know, he, he, what if he turns out to be, be horrible? Then all of a sudden it's my fault. <laughs> I can't, I can't say if somebody's good based on like where they're from, you know, Annapolis is fine. Um, the, uh, you ever visit Capitol Heights, Maryland? Well, yeah, I have. Um, uh, so the, 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 um, the end of the orange line is, is out that area. Um, I used to, when I was in grad school, I used to live actually around that area. Um, I have a really weird story. Maybe I'll wait for, uh, for, um, Carmine to come on and, and, and I'll talk about like, 
talk about it, but it's it, it's some weird some weird area. I used to live out in that area, and and we used to drive we used to drive by this place called Lanham Bar and Grill, and it was like the closest seeming bar to my to my uh, to my house that we were renting, and um one saturday we had nothing to do so my roommate and i are just i'm just like hey you want to go to land and bar and grill and get a beer and we're like okay so we go to we drive up to land and bar and grill and we get out and we get we walk up to the place and it's very clear that it's not a bar but it's an all-black strip club and the, the the bouncers like like kind of mockingly like come on in guys no cover and we didn't want to seem racist so we're like fine let's let's go in so we went and we got we got beers at this all black strip club uh which it's uh we were the only two white guys in there and so like everybody's kind of like walking in and being like what what are these dudes what are these kids what are these guys doing here it's a very very different experience by the way um you know, being in a very poor parts of part, very poor part of DC and, and a very, uh, um, um, but, uh, yeah, it, but I don't know. Everyone was very accepting and like, no one wanted to, no one on the other side, no one, like nobody wanted to be the guys to give like the white guys a hard time. Um, that was it's probably a little North of I'm trying to think like where the, um, Maybe I was maybe that's a little north of Capitol Heights. Um, Lanham is 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 where I was, but like, uh, but Cap, I think Capitol Heights is you know I, I don't know. Uh, maybe things are getting better in these areas, but you know, for for an area of Southeast, like. I don't know, Bladensburg. I don't know. Maybe I was fairly north of Capitol Heights. Actually, Capitol Heights is probably a probably a much rougher area. Anyway, the um, all right. Let's go down here. Do you have the amount of chapter for each character in the fanfic planned out? Like how many chapters Vic will have compared to Sansa? Um, a little bit. It's mostly planned out. Um, but it's not it's not as exciting as you as you think it would be um on on everything. Like it's sort of like you take every character and say how many ca- how many chapters do we need to resolve um the plot? the plot that they have and the answer is usually three (laughs) you know like the answer is usually like three and that's uh, that's essentially like now some some characters obviously get more you know danny you know is is gonna get more um but realistically you kind of say okay well how many like say take 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 a character like bran like how many chapters do you you know would it take to resolve Bran? You kind of go, okay, well, like a Bran one, we just kind of established like that we use in the time loop. Bran two, you have him escape from, you have him escape. And then Bran three, maybe you have him arrive at the wall, you know, getting him back. Cause you kind of fundamentally say like, what's the, the structure of the story is trying to get everyone back to Westeros and south of the wall, south of the wall for the last book. How many, how many chapters can that take? So then you say, take like someone like Victorian. Well, we already have his battle chapter or be- before the battle. And then maybe you have like one post battle and maybe one more, you know, like um, of him like arriving back in Westeros. Um, you know, Quentin, like his battle chapter, one him on the road, one him arriving back in Westeros. You know, you start realizing that it's oh, like three, three kind of works. Theon, like Theon one, Theon him with the dread fort and then Theon somewhere, somewhere else, you know, like you see, and you realize you just, you can't, there's just not much space for that much more. I mean, certain characters, obviously like Tyrion and Danny um, and Ariel Hota deserve much more time. <laughs> but, but once you kind of say like, okay, 
if I'm get, if I'm going to designate three to everybody, how you know how, how you know how how much how much space is there left? Um, and there's not much because what? How many POVs are there? Um, trying to, um, dude, dude, dude. <clears throat> okay. So it says here that, that people are like, there are. <sighs> about there's there's 20 POVs that are currently alive okay well even when you're thinking like the the like George's there's 19 so you, your, your po point of view is are Tyrion, Danny, Arya, Sansa, Bran, Cersei, Davos, Jamie, Brienne, Theon, Sam Victarion, Barristan, Asha, Aaron, Arion, Ario, John Con. That's nineteen. That's nineteen point of views, and then you've got Jon Snow and Quentin in the kind of the maybe category, right? So, but say you got twenty points of view, you multiply twenty by three, and you've got sixty, and then you you leave a few more for for. Um, for Danny, you know, and a few more for Tyrion, and then kind of a, a prologue and an epilogue. So that's two more. And so that leaves like, you know, a handful more if you want to, if you want to like have a handful more for somebody else, you know? So it's, it's a t you know, the, the general rule of thumb is just that there's three, <laughs> there's three for most of them. Um, Ever notice how the Lannisters and Starks both have their servant houses? Starks have pools and Lannisters have pains. Just fun, fun uh, symmetry. Pool and pain. Um, well, pain is is a much more major house uh, in in Lannister um, world than the pools are to the Starks. You know. Mm. But yeah, they they would have. Everyone's gonna have their little their their little servants around, but um, because what Van, Van Poole was what the uh, his like uh, I don't know like his accountant <laughs> his, his accountant, um, Ilan Payne just kind of being a uh, more uh, headsman, but um, I'm trying to think of like um, who they show you know we don't. They just don't kind of have the richness of like the other houses don't have the richness of like these other people kind of hanging around and learning about um, who else is in the household. We hear a little bit about it in in Dorne. I would say like the the next one you've got like Lady Bright, you know, like you know and stuff like that. But um, you don't hear too much about you know who who who's uh, who's cleaning out the Tyrells bedpans. Or who's who's dealing with their books? You know, even the even the the Tullys are. I mean, we we spend a bit of time in the Vale, and we don't really hear about besides like their their master of guards or you know the the head of their their guard. Like, who are these stewards and stuff running around? Um, you know, so they should be they should be around considering we're, we're given so many names at winterfell of all the people we, we know we know the cook we know we know the uh we know the septa um we know the maester we know we know uh the 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 the, the blacksmith you know we we know the dog handler the horse handler it's just so many so many different people um could tyrion be a twin absorbed into the wound as and chimera joanna slept with Tyrion and oberon um or king and oberon giving Tyrion 
black eye and and a reason for fighting him which gives Tyrion two sets of dna two souls yeah this is something that um i've seen in the uh the um the fandom before this is the so there there's this thing called a a chimera um where you essentially have two embryos like fuse in the uh in the womb and so you have two sets of dna and um you can have things like two different colored eyes so this boy it's not it's even before embryo i'm sure it's like zygote or something at that point where it's just like there's a fusing so this this part of his body literally has different DNA than this part of its body, but amazingly, it doesn't affect things like you know the brain developed and everything fine. Um, uh, so the idea is that Tyrion also has two different colored eyes. <clears throat> could um, could he actually be a a chimera? Um, the uh, which would which would then say like okay if he's got two different sets of DNA maybe like if there's something special about like you know Joanna had sex with both Tywin and Aerys could he be both a Targaryen and a Lannister at the same time like crazy stuff like it's certainly up George R Martin's alley like he he writes crazy creepy genetic engineering stuff like that all the time um, could it be his thought. Yeah, I don't think it would actually work in real life. Like the probability of being a dwarf is probably pretty pretty small. For him to be two dwarf DNAs coming together in a chimera fashion would probably not happen. And if it did, like, would he... I suppose if it was just like part of his skull or something, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. But imagine if it happened... At any other point in his body, he would have like a dwarf arm and a not dwarf arm and stuff like that. It would be uh that'd be pretty, pretty, pretty weird stuff. So, I mean, I think it's an intriguing idea and it might have been something that George R. Martin thought about. But I do wonder if he just like abandoned it in the end. Um, yeah. So we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> what's the absolute stupidest thing in the whole series i mean you know I, I do think that the 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 dream for spring fundamentally betrays like the main point of like the character's like starting motivation so i do think it's kind of the dumbest thing like it's one thing to have like something that's silly that doesn't matter or something where you're forcing characters together but it's uh it's hard um it's hard when when you when you've included something that betrays like the very point, like the very fundamental point. Um, like imagine if you had like John Wick, and then you find out that like actually John Wick didn't have a dog. You know, like oh, but that's isn't that like the main thing that like starts the whole story is the fact that he he had a dog. You know. Um, you know, if we, if we discovered that the empire is actually not that bad in star Wars, you know, uh, it's kind of, it's like, it's just such a fundamentally important thing. Um, Tyrion, Tyrion's, his father was actually really nice to him and there wasn't, he didn't have any insecurity. Like his insecurity came from nowhere. Oh, oh. Um, what's the best bar in the DMV? Uh, I have not been out to too many bars recently, but I will tell you that, um, it's closed now, but one of my favorite bars was the Big Hunt, uh, in DuPont was a, it was a very great bar. Um, uh, it's just kind of a chill, big dive bar. Um, I, I actually met my wife there. Um, but I'm trying to think of like some other, and it's just like, it has enough space for everybody and stuff like that. But, you know, I don't know, like bars I like to go to. I liked, 
I guess I liked Rocket Bar in Chinatown. Um, I'm trying to think any like what else was 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 a, a good place to hang. Um, was this was this all the bad? This this is like you realize that you go to the same bars over and over again because you just like them. Um, in in Adams Morgan you used to go to Toledo Lounge. Uh, um, oh, uh, Angles you used to go to Angles a lot in in uh in in DC. I'm trying to think of some other good ones. Um, I mean. These are all like freaking dive bars. I wish I, I, you know, I didn't actually go to Dan's Cafe very much, even though a lot of people really love Dan's Cafe. But uh, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> okay. Did you hear about the news about the casting for Duncan Egg? <clears throat> they put up a casting call for a kid nine to ten and a dude <clears throat> that's like at least twenty four and six four. Um. So it's not quite. So they did put up a casting call. So yes, the the Dunkin' Egg uh, casting call came out, and it's just it's them. It's it's for Dunkin' Egg. So for Egg, they've they've they want a kid that's nine to ten, and they want him to be. Hold on a second. Hello. Um, uh, 你会说英文吗? Oh, 没关系, 没关系. Um, 对, no, 我, 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 我不是台湾人, no, no, 我, 我外国人, okay, okay, bye bye. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, so the the uh, the casting call is um, uh, so the uh, he has to be at least nine by March of 2024, which is um, the uh, I guess that's for some sort of legal reasons or something. But you, you know, so and then. Um, they want, he's essentially supposed to be confident, like a confident, you know, young boy, nine to 10. And then for dunk, they want someone between the ages of 18 and 24, um, who's six, four of any ethnicity. And that's the interesting thing at the end that they put, they said any ethnicity. Um, I think they're probably looking, I mean, keep in mind that like when you go six, four, there's not that many actors out there. So they're, they're they're kind of ta- kind to of say like anybody is is available, but I think we're you know we may find that Dunk is not white um, in the end, which is fine because we don't know anything about Dunk's parentage. So, I mean, other than the fact that like people are like, but Brienne is descended from Dunk, and Brienne is this like blonde woman, and you're like, yeah, okay, fine, but it's like it's generations down, so it's it's, it's all right. Um, so the uh, but I I think we're pr- I think there's a good chance, if not probable, that Dunk will will not be will not be white, um. Because when you really look at like, uh, even House of the Dragon, like besides Corlise, as a, you know, and, and Lenor, who you know, Corlise is kind of a main. He's not even like one of the main main leads. He's like off a little. Um, I think they'll probably be, be trying to looking for someone that's not white to, to have, to have dunk. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, but again, you, when you go with actors that are six, four, that's just, there's not many out there. Right. So, but yes, it's happening. They're going full steam ahead. Um, they have their first script written and filming is probably going to begin in March and the, um, my guess is that because House of the Dragon is going to be in 2024 and they need House of the Dragon to be where it is because 
because of the writer's strike, you have a very empty 2024 schedule. So you, they kind of need House of the Dragon to be there. Um, and then it takes like a year and a half for filming for season three of House of the Dragon. So you 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 film um, Duncan Egg and then you release Duncan Egg in 2025 in between the space between House of the Dragon seasons one and two. But... Uh, um, Uh, will the fanfic go to the Far East? A shy Shadowlands five forts, great waste. No time for it. How many points of view will be left at the start of Dream? Um, I th I think the plan right now is for Danny to go to Karth. I don't think she's going to go any further than Karth. Um, and it's just that there's no time. There's no time for it. And I don't necessarily think that there's that much to really be explored that would warrant it. There's a lot of plot lines in Karth that need to be wrapped up. Um, Danny needs to run into Zaro again. She needs to run into Quaith. Perhaps deal with the Pureborn and the Thirteen and, and, the, and the, the Spicer Guild and things like this. Um, maybe you know talk about that dragon that was that was that was found in the in the desert in the in the Red Waste and stuff like that. Um, that can all happen. You know, in the House of the Undying, you know, and whatever. But when you start saying like, oh, well, what, what's what's there to see in a shy? And you're like, well, you know, Jorah wanted to go to a shy. Mel is from a shy. Like, you know, there's stuff like that. But when you're talking like necessary plot elements that need to be resolved, like characters that we need to have come back at least one more time, there's there, there's nothing that really warrants it. It's just that's just like we're opening world building that doesn't need to be opened. You know, we're acting too much like George, you know, if we would do that. <laughs> um, I mean, it's not that these things can't be talked about or something, but it's just, it's just not necessary when, when we're talking like what needs to be done. Like you have a need to get done list and it's like Zaro, Quaith, Warlocks, you know, that kind of needs to, needs to be done. But what what's in a shy? Like who's in a shy that Danny needs to meet? Nah, nobody. You know, it's not that it wouldn't be fun, but it's a lot of a lot of time, a lot of time, a lot of time. Um, been a musician for tenish years, and I have all these instruments I want to give you in karma. No worries if you hate them. It's um oh all all these instrumentals. Um, that I want to give you in karma. I was about to be like, you're going to send us instruments? <laughs> no worries if you want, if you hate them. It's silly pop and rap. Where do I send them though? Also, Rhaegar's Mance. Um, yeah, I mean, you can send, you can send uh, my, my, I have an email on, on, on the, the site, um, you know, Preston Jacobs Business Inquiry, or you can send it to the fanfic one, which is Sweet Robin's Fanfic Project. I think uh, Carmine has official Red Team Review. Um, you know, we, 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 we have, we have official emails, but yeah, you know, so some, some fun little music and instrumentals. Those are, those are always great to hear. I love, I love stuff like that. And thank you. Thank you for, uh, for, uh, for writing that kind of stuff. Um, uh, let's... <laughs> um, she just gave up because you're a foreigner yeah she was she was uh she was just trying to yeah sell something um but like like she was trying to sell, sell me a, a credit card kind of stuff and sometimes i'm just like like i don't so i'm like insecure enough where i'm just like i hope this isn't actually like my kid's daycare and i'm like i'm not interested and hang up so i have to like really make sure that the person on the other end is someone that's like not important. So I've got to like, you know, you, you get this dread where I'm just like, ah, oh, fuck. Like it's probably, it's probably somebody selling something, but it could be like my kid's daycare. 
And so I can't just be like, I'm not interested. Like, imagine if like I, I get the translation wrong and they're like, yeah, you, your kid's sick. You need to come come in and pick him up. And I'm like, I, I'm not interested. Like, I hang up. Like, I've got to like really go through and figure it out. And like, it's like I hear different, you know, I'm just like, okay. I, you know, it's like I recognize that she said like something, something about my, my, my like a credit card and stuff like that. And I'm just like, ah. And then I just kind of go to my, my, my kind of line like, oh, like do you speak English? And then, you know, if it's important, they'll be like, they'll be like, Oh, I'll try. Um, and, but if, if it's not, if they're trying to sell something, they're just like, ah, no worries, no worries. Um, Preston, could you not play this role? Six, three, maybe pass for 28. Um, I'm six, I'm close to six, six. And I, I height wise, I'd be in there, but um, I'm way too old. I'm also, they, oh, they also wanted somebody that's like physically like big and imposing. And I would have to work out like nonstop <laughs> and then, and then, and then lose like, then become 20, 25 years younger and probably get a British accent, you know, <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe Oz Gray. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe Sir Eustace. <laughs> I thought Dickon was was six five. You know, I will say that in Europe, I see taller actors than in America. America, it's very hard. Um, it's very hard to get into acting. If you're tall now, granted there's, yeah, there's people like the rock or whatever, but remember he started as a wrestler, but, um, <clears throat> but a lot has to do with like people that start in acting in America. They start a lot of times in state on stage, right? They're in high school theater. They're in college theater and you don't get those roles. If you're super tall, like they're just like, no, he looks weird on stage. You know, I want him to, I want him around the same height as the lead as the lead female. So you're actually like much more, you're, you're much more likely to get work um, as like a, a shorter man um, uh, or at least get into acting as a shorter man in America. For some reason, I see it in Europe a lot more. <clears throat> there's, ex there's, there's exceptions. I mean, Tim Robbins is very tall, um, stuff like that. But, but there's definitely like, there's definitely like moments because I did, I did high school theater and like, there's definitely moments where there's, they're just like, oh, you know, we want to see the, the two leads and they have to be around the same height. And you're just like, all right, well, I guess I'm not getting that, <laughs> you know. <clears throat> Brie Larson is dunk. We can do this. The hottest, the hottest dunk ever. Yeah. People still bitching about poor, poor Brie Larson. I want to say that like she's still a target like people people still still making people still making youtube millionaires like brie larson videos still turning people into millionaires um they all had his face beautiful work uh to you and the team it was worth the wait thank you thank you i i appreciate it it was um the brand chapter was uh was a lot of work um and you know the the that end that that line particular was was inspired by george but um you know, it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a fun little, fun little chapter. Um, um, I'm glad it came out really well, but it took some, it took some time. It took some time. Hopefully you guys will like <clears throat> the next chapters that are going to be done are going to be Barristan two, Quentin, Tyrion three. Um, Cause just, we just want to deal with the, just going to try to close out the, the, um, the battle of fire and, um, I hope I hope people are gonna like those chapters. Um, um, Preston is dunk and Carmine is egg. Who says no? That might that might work. I mean, uh, that might work. I mean, that's that's. <laughs> That that would be our good Halloween costume if we could if we we could show up somewhere as Dunkin' Egg. I don't know if Carmine's willing to like shave his head, but um, that might be pretty funny. 
Um, <laughs> ever meet the president, VP, or secretary of state, or anyone that high up? Um, in my job, no. Um, I met... <sighs> No, I mean, I guess I met Biden when he was VP very briefly. I told that story online. Or, uh, I told that story, right, of, of meeting Biden. Um, that was in like 2009, 2010. Never met, never met Obama. I met Bill Clinton. I shook his hand at my graduation because he was the speaker at my graduation. Um, been in the same like room many times, like a few times with... Um, with Hillary, but I never talked to her or anything like, or met her or anything like that. She was just like in a room, like when, when there's like hundreds of other people, you know, and, and, uh, or what's walked by her in the hall, you know, like, it's just like, um, but no, nobody, nobody really, uh, <clears throat> I don't think I've, I don't, I've never had a meeting where I've talked to them about, about anything like that. You know, this is just, um, uh, I just happened to meet Biden once unrelated to like my job. He just like, and then, you know, passed by people, but no, no, nobody, nobody really talked. Um, imagine Brie Larson kissing old man in Winterfell. That might be nice. That might be nice. I mean, if, if like I say, timeline, I mean, George is sloppy, but timeline wise, it doesn't make sense for for it to be old nan that um uh that that dunk is is kissing however you know i i i, I think i picked um one of the other starks uh like a sarah stark or something um as the as the girl he was kissing but i i, I don't think it's old nan just because the old nan, old nan timeline wise doesn't make sense. She was she was brought in to be the the um, uh, nanny for like one of the one of the one of the children of the she wolves of Winterfell's kids. So she's like about fifteen years off um, in the great thing. Um, let's see, Blake Griffin. Oh, basketball player as as a uh, as a <clears throat> they might get an unknown. Preston met Omarosa. I never met Omarosa. I wish. Um, <laughs> yeah, everyone's crazy. Um. Uh, why in George R. R. Martin's mind was it necessary to introduce Aegon? The story was already out of control by that point. Aegon seems to be an easy omission if your goal is to actually finish writing the story. Um, <clears throat> hmm. It's an interesting question because I think from the beginning, from the very beginning of, of um, George had the plan of a, a Targaryen civil war. Like that was, that was in the cards. Because he had he had already introduced um, in the John early John chapters. I want to say it's um, the first chapter of of a clash of kings with John, where he starts talking about where Gior starts talking about Maester Aemon's backstory. Um, let me let me get the exact. No, it's not. Maybe it's in Game of Thrones. No. No, it's John 1. John 1, A Clash of Kings. And keep in mind that John 1, A Clash of Kings was written, well written by the time um, A Game of Thrones came out. So <clears throat> we have here <clears throat> um, The Iron, the Iron Throne passed to the last of Daron's four sons. That was Makar, Aemon's father. And the new king summoned all his sons to court. 
and would have made <coughs> Eamon part of his councils, but he refused, saying that he would <coughs> usurp uh, the place rightly belonging to the Grand Maester. Instead, he served the keep of the eldest brother, another Daron. Well, that one died too, leading only the feeble widowed daughter as heir. Some pox caught her, I believe. The next was Arian, Arian the Monstrous. The very one, though he named himself Arian Brightflame, one night uh, in his cups, he drank wildfire. Um, not quite a year after, Makar died in battle as an outlaw lord. Um, and then he said the next was the next year was the Great Council, and they passed over Arian's infant son and Prince Daron's daughter and gave the crown to Aegon. So we've already kind of established that there was a that there was a passing over with a great council of people that would have been king. And the, and the reasoning isn't really very good, you know? Like he he just kind of says that like only a madman would want to have someone in Arian's line be he says no sane man wanted any blood of Arian's on the throne. And Darian Darian's Daron's girl was a lackwit besides being a, a female. So we established well back that there are other Targaryen lines out there and that there can be like, you know, confusion and, and, and stuff like that. So that, so from the beginning, he always had this idea that there was going to be a Targaryen civil war. And that's, and probably this idea that there was going to be a second dance of the dragons. Um, now granted the, the, the dance of the dragons is used mainly uh, at this point in a feast for crows as like the stand-in for for Marcella and Tommen. But nonetheless, like he has an appendix talking about how there is a dance of the dragons between between Rhaenyra and Aegon. And so, you know, having a second dance and having some sort of dispute. So I just think, you know, you're right that it maybe wasn't necessary, but um and and obviously the show cut it out completely. Um, and it wasn't really, I mean, a lot of things went wrong with the show, but was, was the lack of Aegon really a problem? Um, so yeah, it was an easy omission, but I don't know. I don't know. Like the thing is like, you, this is all like kind of the, the logic of, of like getting in George's head. Like, why doesn't he do this? Why doesn't he kill off this character? Why doesn't he like shrink the story? And then we just haven't had any action for of, of George doing that. There's there like he's never cut off a plot line. He's never shrunk the story yet. Um, it's just it's like why hasn't why hasn't George done the logical thing? Like well I don't know you know <laughs> like a feast for crows and a dance with dragons is huge plot growing um, book. You know maybe maybe he was very uh, maybe he was very arrogant. Maybe he um, thought he had all the time in the world maybe he never maybe he was just only interested in writing what interested him and like new plot lines were more interesting than trying to close plot lines that that he didn't know how to finish in a satisfying way um it's hard it's hard to get into into his head um you know, I, I, I know his mindset a little more when it comes to like Fire and Blood and how that book came about. Because um, that one, that one's, it's a little more documented better in his blog and, and what was going on behind the scenes on like why he, why Fire and Blood came about and why that was released. But like what was going on in George's mind during a feast, the feast period and the Dance with Dragons period, I it's less lesser known. Like you kind of know that he he originally had this plan for a Dance of the Dragons, and then he wrote this like Arms of the Kraken story, and he just that was really important to include all these Ironborn, and then he he had established all this Dornish stuff with with Oberyn, and so now you've got these three big plot lines that he needed to introduce um, of Dornish, Ironborn, and and uh, Targaryen civil war and uh it just without the five year gap he needed to like to slow roll everything and now it's just uh it's huge
So I don't know. Um, could Varys or anyone have ordered John Aaron's murder by pretending to be Littlefinger in letters to Lysa? Just finishing second read of A Game of Thrones. Hmm. Um. Hmm. I don't think so. Um, I'm trying to think like, so keep in mind that I think the discussion between Littlefinger and Lysa about the murder of John Aaron probably happened, um, when both of them were in King's Landing. So there wouldn't have been letters between them. They would have been actually talking. Um, so Lysa flees King's Landing after her, after John Aaron dies and Littlefinger is in King's Landing. So they are in the same place, presumably like speaking in, 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 um, in, in presumably speaking in secret, but speaking in person. Um, you know, we get this idea of like, oh, Lysa is in the veil, but like she doesn't go to the veil until until John Aaron dies. Uh, she flees with Sweet Robin. And the reason she flees, like, it's these other things we don't think about very much. Like, let's remember that, like, Sweet Robin was raised at court. Like, um, Stannis is at court. <laughs> you know, like, all these people that we, when we enter the story, they're gone. But we forget that, like, there was a pre-Game of Thrones period where people were hanging out. Like, Sweet Robin and Tommen, like, would be, would hang out, you know, as little kids. Um, like, Joffrey would have known Sweet Robin. We don't think about these things, but that must have been the case. You know, Marcella would have known Sweet Robin. Um, so... For Var for Varys to say like write a letter to to Lysa, and have her not like talk to Littlefinger in person and confirm it would be it would be a bit much. Um, again, it's it like I say it's it, it's it's re it's weird and jarring to think about the pre the pre a Game of Thrones like court world because they don't talk about it very much. You know, it comes up very little. Like. Um, Barristan being on the small council, like, you know, and knowing all these and knowing Pycelle, you know, or like these things kind of come up every once in a while, but like you forget that like all of them were there together. Um, so I don't, I think that the little finger Lysa plan must have been face to face for her to, for her to, uh, to murder John Aaron. But, um, Mm -hmm. Let's see here. <laughs> Did Preston grow up a Bullets fan? Uh, keep in mind, I grew, I grew up in Baltimore and the Baltimore Bullets hadn't moved yet. Um, so I, I didn't really, I mean, I liked, <clears throat> um, Baltimore didn't really have a, a, a basketball team. Um, now, would I've like defaulted to 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 uh, to DC? I don't know. I just never did. Um, so I didn't. I didn't really. Uh, when I was very very young, we were we were in Milwaukee, and I, I went to a lot of Bucks games. But like, no, I never. Um, I was never a Bullets fan. But the uh, I had a Baltimore Bullets T-shirt once. But the. Um, um, how hard was it to write the brand chapter? Um, the hardest, the hardest part was, um, the hardest part, like the original <clears throat> words that came out weren't so, weren't so bad. And, the, and keep in mind that like when a chapter comes together, there's a lot of times there's, there's, um, 
a good section where you know you have you, like sometimes you get a submission and they um a lot like a large portion of it's really good and you can like pull over a whole page or several chapters of something and so when that happens it's really great um sometimes like you don't get something like that and we, we you know something has to be kind of like created from scratch so with bran a lot of um a lot of <clears throat> pieces were brought over from the submissions because the submissions were, were, were quite strong. And so, you know, like the, the conversations between Bran and Mira were, were brought over, um, were brought over largely wholesale, the conversations between Bran and, and Blood Raven, like largely wholesale descriptions of like the, the, um, the, uh, the pit at the end and, and like the ice spires and stuff is pulled over. And then, and then you get to like edit and craft. And that was very difficult. Um, but then there's, there's some things that like, you know, something's not right. And so you have to create something from, from scratch, which like the transition paragraphs, like the the moon was hidden and things like that. Um, that can take time. Um, the dire wolf, like in the mind of, of summer, it was like mainly created from scratch um, and stuff like that. So, you know, you get these little, little things like that. So it all, it all kind of depends on like how much can be, can be brought over. Um, <clears throat> um, and how much needs to be created now after that. So, so like the first writing, like the first draft of brand happened pretty fast, but then it was just, getting all the tone and getting everything right and reorganizing everything and, and having the, um, the, the voice be correct. And the, the editors, uh, spent a lot of time and I spent a lot of time with the editors, like getting all of that right. <clears throat> but, um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so that's, that's, um, that's the whole, that's the whole thing there. So, it was, it was, it was very difficult and time consuming. Like, I don't know if it was like hard. It was just one of those things where it's like, you get that first draft and it's good. And then you spend time with editors and it's pretty good. And you do it again because you want it even better than pretty good, you know? And, and it's like, how many times can you redo it until you think it's good enough? You know, it's, until you think it's excellent. Um, and at some point you got to stop at some point you got to be like, all right, it's, it's, it's out. Like I can do this forever. And some people wonder if this is George R. Martin's like problem that he just keeps like re looking over the same thing over and over again, wanting it to be perfect. And it's never going to be perfect, you know, perfect being the enemy of good. Um, so I think with brand, there was a bit of, <clears throat> there was a bit of that, like perfect being the enemy of good. <clears throat> I just wanted it, wanted it to be really, really, cause it's brand. Because it's Bran. I wanted it to be really, really good. Especially when we're doing something like fundamentally, ch like, you know, some people are still not into the time loop theory or the time traveling Bran theory. When you're doing something this great, you know, you want it to be really beautiful, um, which kind of allows it. Like, <clears throat> if people were to say, like, um, like, flat out, like, oh, Sweet Robin becoming king is a silly idea. If you just told that, oh, and, and like, imagine you're describing the fanfic to somebody and you're like, yeah, Sweet Robin becomes king, becomes king. The immediate reaction to people from people is, is, um, well, that's, 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 that's silly. That's stupid. Um, and so like with the, with the Elaine, Elaine two, like spent a lot of time, like crafting that ending. And I really love the the ending of Elaine. Like it's really like touching and beautiful. And in that moment, it does make sense that Sweet Robin becomes king. You know, and you 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 need you need that thing. You need something very emotional and good and and, and powerful to justify kind of like big big decisions. If it's something like little, like nothing's happening, um, of of relevance. You know, you probably, it probably doesn't need to be like absolutely perfect, but if you're going to do something crazy, you got, you, you better make it great writing and it better be beautiful and it better be emotionally powerful, which I think the end of Elaine achieves that. I, and I think like Bran achieves that, you know, um, in a sense, you have to try harder 
if if you're gonna do if you're if you're making a big u-turn you better be very very practiced in it you know um and so now like if, if somebody's like oh sweet robin sweet robin is uh you know him becoming a king is silly i'd be like well read the elaine sample chapter i mean i'm not a late sample chapter read elaine two and then tell me after reading that that it's silly um i i you know i I would say that not many people would be able to do that. Like, cause I actually think like it's a good chapter. It's the same with like Bran. Like, like if somebody's like, Oh, time traveling Bran is a stupid idea. Well read, read Bran and then tell me that, you know, um, you know, I'm pre- pretty proud of like what, what the, what the, the writers and the, and the editors and everything have, have been able to like put together. So it's really, it's quite nice. You know, it's a lot of, a lot of hard work from people. So. Um, <laughs> there's some weird, some weird, uh, <laughs> some weird discussion going on, going on in here. Um, <laughs> okay. I, I hope your throat voice is feeling better. No one else can narrate the fanfic because I said so, and we love you. Uh, we'll make them fly if we if if they try to. Um, thank you, thank you so much. That's just like um, this, you know, just ma- just make making Preston blush here. Um, yeah, no, no, I I I, I uh, I'm I'm re- I'm reading it. Preston Jacobs AI can narrate. <laughs> um. Yeah, you know the, uh, um, you know, I, 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 I think just like you know, going slow and having emotion and caring about it, like, can can bring out the the, um, the, the, the chapters quite a bit, you know, um, uh, so, you know, I, I, I don't want to half-ass that after after like putting so much work into something, you don't want to like half-ass the the narration. Which, which which I spend a, a bit of time on too, just to get that right. Um. <laughs> um but yeah, it's funny though because um, God, I've I've seen on like, so you know, every once in a while, like I'll I'll Google like the fanfic to see if like what other people are saying about it in other locations because obviously you guys like, just you guys. Are, are are all very very nice to me and so it's like i don't want to be in a bubble so i to torture myself occasionally i try to find like other other places where people talk about it um and what's funny is that like i i have found people trashing it but it's very clear that they haven't read it you know <laughs> like because i don't think that like anybody could could actually be like oh it's just like the worst written thing in the world like you know, because I, I, that's just like false. It's almost it's just like objectively false. Like the worst you could possibly say is like, eh, you know, not as good as George or something. Like that would be a more realistic thing. But for someone, you know, but um, the uh, but yeah, anyone can narrate it if you like. I don't own it. You can do anything you want with it. Like I said, it's all public domain. Um, uh um love the last chapter how close are we to the next chapter george could uh, would be proud to see how slow you're taking it um i have to check in with with some editors the the uh there's a good there's a good there's a pretty good draft of of barristan 2 right now but um you know i have to i have to check with people's people's schedules on like how much time they have because not every not every uh editor is taking a look at it so um it's uh and in in that process like while we wait for one like another one gets going so like quentin is 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 getting put together i'm spending some time on quentin um but quentin quentin is uh it's quentin's hard quentin's hard um because just trying to describe it's just hard in the sense that we're trying to like transition from like viewing a riot 
to flashback to to um to dialogue and 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 making this making this transition and everything is 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 hard so um <laughs> this pressure needs to do over analyzing for the fanfic that's that's true i try to do the the, the going over videos which are which are right um why weren't Aegon the Force bastards through Otheris from Bravos not considered great bastards? Uh, sea Star's mother from Lice, and she's considered a great bastard. Um, the answer, the, the short answer is because George didn't think things through. Um, Aegon, Aegon has a whole bunch of bastards, like I say, the Butterwell bastards, or or the the like I say, the the Bravos bastards. Um, he. Uh, he, you know, they should definitely be involved in things, you know, um, and definitely like make claims and things like that, considering that like Aegon legitimis, legitimized them all. Um, so it's just, it's one of those things that George just kind of wrote and then didn't think about it. And maybe thought like later on he would come up with something, but there, there, there's a lot of these, there's a lot of these bastards floating around that, that should you know, does it really make sense? For ex for example, that that um, the Butterwells, if there were a bunch of like legitimized bastards, they wouldn't have tried to, I don't know, make a claim or married one off to the to the Blackfires or something like that. I mean, maybe you could come up with some some headcanon that that explains like the egg gift. You know, that like they needed to give the egg in order for all of them to renounce their claim or something. You know, on why the Butterwells were given an egg. Um, but, uh, but, um, yeah, it, it's the real answer is George wasn't thinking it through because it's just so polit. It's like, it's such a political, um, thing to have this very powerful person in, in Bravos be, be a claimant to the Iron Throne. Um, <laughs> Gardeners grow weeds too if they're not careful. Yeah, it's true. Um, <laughs> we'll bring back Quentin, the character with a forgettable story, but he's going to keep John dead. LOL. I don't get it. LOL. Um, I don't know if John is dead. Like, I think John John has an interesting story too. Um, but I think there's an interesting story in in Ghost. Um, so it's not that John's dead. John's a very important character. Quentin, Quentin, um, also plays an important role in that he needs to, he needs to capture a dragon. Like logistically speaking, um, I think it's more interesting to have three separate dragons. Um, if you leave behind two dragons, like say, Dan, say Danny comes to Westeros with two dragons against one dragon like obviously the person with two dragons is going to win. Um, you know, like uh or if Victarion kidnaps two dragons, like how is she having a dance with dragons against against uh Aegon? You know? I I'm just fundamentally saying like if we're going to have a dance a, a second dance of the dragon, there needs to be a dragon on Aegon's side. And so either, you know, Victorian brings one dragon and they have a two versus one, or he has two dragons and it's a one versus two. But why is Victorian joining, joining Aegon's cause? I mean, we can come up with something, but it's a little weird. So, you know, logistically speaking, it's just like, we need someone to have to bring a dragon to Aegon and Quentin is the perfect, the perfect person to do that. Who else is going to do it? Who else is going to capture that dragon? Marwyn? <laughs> Arch and drink by themselves? Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it just makes the character, it makes the, the, the Quentin chapters more useful and, and, and relevant. Um, I just think there's just so much that needs to be resolved with Quentin alive. Like the, the fund, like fundamentally, like his relationship with his father and like so much of the Arian story is a sibling rivalry. And so if Quentin's dead, it's like, oh, right. She had this huge sibling rivalry and it turned out our sibling was dead and it was, it was over nothing, you know? Um, so we'll see. Um, 
Where's Carmine today? Where is Carmine? Uh, he, he he had some topic that now I'm forgetting what it was, but he wanted to talk about something with me today and I forgot what it was. Um, Quantum chapter. Oh, well. All right, what do we got? We got. We, it's time for any questions, you guys. Time for any questions you want. We we. I've I've made it to the end of chat. Um. Mister Plum gets a dragon. Okay, that you know that might work. That might work. I mean, it, you know, that's an interesting possibility that it, that it's Brown Ben Plum who claims a dragon who brings who brings it home to Westeros. Um, hmm. Just that he's not a bold. I mean, I I get it. Like it's you know he's got he's got blood and everything, but he's not bold, right? He's not a bold sellsword. It's kind of against his personality. I understand that, like logistically, he's somebody that like makes a little more sense than other people. But how is he getting that? How is he getting that dragon? How is he just walking over to a dragon? Um, and uh, um, what's the meaning of Shireen's dream about eating about being eaten by a dragon? That's a good question. Um, so at the beginning of a Clash of Kings. Uh, Shireen talked about, she said, I had a bad dream about the dragons. They were coming to eat me. And Cresson, Cresson is just a, is just an idiot. And he's just like, we've talked about this before. The dragons are just stone things on dragon stone. They're not going to come to life. Um, they're carved out of stone child. Uh, so you see, there's nothing to fear. Um, and he just, he just, uh, he just drops, he drops the ball, drops the ball on the whole thing. Um, what about the thing in the sky? Dalla and Matrice were talking about it as well. And Dalla said that um, she heard the red woman tell mother that it was dragon's breath. If the dragons are breathing, does that mean that... They are coming to life. Um, or does Shireen actually believe the, sto the, the, the stone dragons uh, are uh, are going to come to life? Now this comes to... Um, I suppose you could... One could say that it might relate to the beast... Um, so at, at the end of a clash of Kings, we find out that there's a stone beast that's breathing flame in the house of the undying. Right. And so some people have interpreted that as, um, as grayscale. And so if the stone, if the dragons are coming to eat her and the stone beast is grayscale, in a sense, the dragons are already eating her. Um, and she's saying that like the, you know, the, the grayscale is, is, is going to come back or something, which is what, you know, somewhat hinted in, in, with uh with with Dalla at the wall. What's funny is that or with Val at the wall. It's funny that they use the name Dalla twice. I mean Dalla. Dalla is this random servant on on Dragonstone, but Dalla is also a wildling, um, sister to Val. Um so yeah, I guess Shireen's dream is the best explanation, I suppose, is that it's that she's talking about her grayscale, the same kind of gray this is assuming that the beast in the stone dragon in um in the house of the undying is grayscale as well um 
Um, will Barristan live to return to Westeros? I'm just, eh, you know, I'm trying to have it be a surprise. I think there's a good chance. I think there's a good chance. Um, uh, do you think the question is, is, I think the question is more, will he continue as a POV? Um, or will another POV? Because as, as, as characters converge into plot, into plot lines, like, um, will he continue? I don't know. Um, hmm. Why do you think George will never finish? He recently said he's late, but he's working on it. Um, I think that when, in all honesty, when you look at something like a 12 year wait, um, and people c try to come up with all sorts of like rationale about like, oh, the story is very difficult to write. Um, oh, it got too big, maybe. And then they start coming up with reasons. Maybe if he didn't have these other projects and maybe if he had time to, to, to put things together or, and they'll cope and say, I dream of spring should be easier because the, the plot is, is going to be more streamlined and simple. I think realistically, when you look at all other writers who have had really bad writer's block and have been unable to finish their series. You find that there's a personal reason why. Um, and I want to, I don't want to speculate too much on his personal, on his personal reasons and his personal life, but I suspect that, that it's not that the reason that George isn't finishing is not the story. I don't, and I don't think it's because of work responsibilities and things like this. I think that there is a personal reason um, that's preventing him from finishing. And I don't think that personal reason is going away. Um, I recently, uh, watched a video, uh, watched a video about the King Killers chronicle guy. Um, and Patrick, pra Patrick, um, Rothfuss. And he got in a bit of trouble recently because he had, there was a, there was a fundraiser for charity where he said, Hey, I'm going to release a, a chapter from book three of the King killers Chronicles, um, King killer Chronicles. And, um, he, uh, people kind of said like, okay, great. And they, they donated a bunch of money and he never released it. And he, and he went and he finally came out like two, two and a half years passed. And he finally came in and he was like, Oh, I'm sorry guys. It's just that like, I didn't want to put down, put a crappy thing on. And then I was like, what if I got someone to read it? And then it started becoming bigger and bigger. And then I wanted it to be perfect. And then the whole thing fell apart. And I'm just really sorry. And you realize that like, he's been saying that like the, that depression has been keeping him from finishing the books. And it was very, very clear to me watching this guy, this miserable guy trying to explain why he didn't release his chapter that he is still utterly, utterly depressed and in need of like some, some medical attention. Like it's, it's very, very clear to me when, when I, when I see him and, and, and I'm just like, when people are like, oh, well, like maybe he'll come up with that third book. His personal problem is the, is the thing that's not going away, you know? And so I think that with George, there is a personal problem. And it's, it's, you know, everybody comes up with these, these solutions like, oh, this barrier is going to be released and all of a sudden it's going to be done. No, like there's a problem. We know there's a problem. It's been 12 years. And even before that, there was a problem. There was a, pro there's a problem with the structure of dance. There's a problem with the structure of feast. There's a serious problem, you know? So I, it's just, uh, it's, it's all of that. Like, um, do you have a working title for Quentin chapter, The Burn Suitor? Uh, currently, it's The Man in the Pyramid. Um, I haven't come across anything I like better. I mean, I'm, I'm open to change, but right now I, I'm going with The Man in the Pyramid. Um, yeah. Um, LML was talking about Tully symbolism. And I wonder if there is anything to 
Dermont of the Rainwood, Rainwood, and Adam, Adam Marbrand, Tree on Fire, leading searches on opposite sides of the river. Hmm. Um, I have to look up Dermot of the Rainwood. Um, like you're saying like rain wood being like wet wood while the, the tree being on fire on the other side. Um, I don't know. I mean, it might just be like a, uh, a happy coincidence, but you know, when I think about Marbrand and the burning tree, like I obviously think of a burning werewood and like the Andal invasion and things like that. I mean, I could be wrong, but you know, that, that's the first thing that comes to mind for me that, that this is like that, the, that the, that the Marbrands are, are some sort of like very Andal house. That's against, that's against the first men. And so they, they came in and they burned the werewoods or something. Um, you know, weirdly though, in the world of ice and fire, they say that the, that it's, it was formed by a union of the first men in the Andals during the coming of the Andals. See, I would have, I would have much preferred based on that sigil, like that they just, the Andals just freaking wiped out the previous first men's house and like burned their werewood. Like that would make more sense to me rather than it being like a marriage. But who knows? Who knows? This is all my issues with like the world of ice and fire. But uh, the um um the uh hmm but fire and water on the different sides of 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 the of the river. I mean, I suppose, I'm not sure how much, um, they, uh, they think about like, uh, like what, what it would all mean, like water and fire. Um, exactly. Um, the, um, and how much, how much symbolism like George thinks about and how deep he goes. Um, but I don't know, besides like fire and water, like what more could be said? Um, like is, is water, water and wood, like more, more first men, uh, werewood loving while fire and werewood is, is first men hating and old gods and, and, uh, and new gods. I mean, maybe in the sense of they're trying to protect the, the Isle of the Isle of Faces and this is the this is the uh the frontier of it or something i don't know i don't know <laughs> why does the wheel of time show hate rand i think people really loved rand i mean he was he was uh he was pretty um I mean, he got buff and they gave him a lot of like scenes where he got to show off his, his, his chest. Um, but I think they, I think maybe people are saying that because Rand's like, Rand doesn't save the day, but I think a lot of that was, was straight from the book. So, so about who gets to blow the horn and, and who gets to save Egwene and stuff like that. Like Egwene saves herself and uh, Matt blows the horn and, and all of the plot, all the plot threads are taken away from Rand. Um, but I think that's straight from the book. So I don't know, but uh, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't come across like, hate. in fact, I think I like show Rand more than I like book Rand weirdly, but I don't know. Some people say Rand is kind of unlike unlikable entitled piece of shit, I suppose. But like, at least show brand show Rand seems to have a little bit more anguish and, and uh, in, in his face, but mainly centered around a completely invented show plot of him having this sexual relationship. Um, do you, be do you believe the theory that Euron is one of blood Raven's former disciples? Will he be a dark counterpart antagonist to Bran? Um, I I think that in an older world 
where I thought Blood Raven was more of the the Grand Puppet Master. I perhaps believe that, but once once you sort of replace Blood Raven as the Grand Puppet Master with time traveling Bran, all of a sudden it becomes Eur- Euron becomes a puppet of time traveling Bran, um, and that he was a disciple of time traveling Bran in in a sense, you know, um, rather than Blood Raven. Because you kind of say like, well, what? What are Blood Raven's like motivations? What does he want? How does Euron um, like meet those meet those uh, meet those desires? Um, you kind of feel that like Blood Raven is anti is anti um, uh, Blackfire, <laughs> anti Blackfire. But like, if anything, Euron's invasion is helping the Blackfires. So it doesn't really um, make sense in that sense. I mean, unless like the red wines are black fires and he's just using him to like kill off the, the red wine fleet. Um, but you'd also think that like as Blood Raven's desire has gone beyond just the black fires, you know, what is he really thinking about? Um, but I think it's more, it makes more sense that he's, he's a disciple of time traveling Bran because we're actually getting visions um of the future and so far we have no notion that blood raven can predict the future while the visions of aaron include like future events so i think i think it's more time traveling bran um is divorce in a song of ice and fire or just separation there is no divorce in a song of ice and fire um that's not a uh they sometimes use the term set aside um but that is um i'm trying to think because because obviously the the faith of the seven is a stand-in for the catholic church and there's no divorce in catholicism and most of early christianity does not really like have it um it's why that's why like Islam like embracing divorce was like a very big revolution. Um, so Doran is still married. I'm trying to think of like events where a wife was set aside successfully, um, rather than just like polygamy happening or something like that. Um, but I don't know. Nothing. Nothing is a. Uh, nothing is um, coming to mind. Um, will you collab more with Amber from Road to Tarvalon? Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, when when more uh, Wheel of Time stuff, or anytime she wants to come on here, she's she's welcome. She, you know, she's got the uh, she's got the code. Whenever she wants to uh, to to call in, she can. So yeah, whenever is um. But yeah, she's great. Um, I'm writing a fantasy book with your experience. Fan fiction wise, what are the best things a writer can learn from George? Stuff you might not learn from other authors. His chapter structure is definitely unique. Um, I think one of George's strengths that I think is helpful for for writing is to actually treat each chapter like a short story in itself. I think a lot of people just they, they I think a lot of people have a big book. And they kind of say, okay, this is where I need to get and I'm just going to start writing. And there's no real break on why a chapter happens or like you do, you're you not really thinking about the themes of each chapter. And I think by breaking it up, and because George is a trained short story writer. And so he writes like a short story writer. And each of his chapters has a, like a firm, like mo I wouldn't say all, but most of his chapters have like a firm beginning and end with a story by itself you know for example like we take like Catalan's chapter where she where with with the with rob's will you know that is a story in itself um you know it begins with her discussing this will there's this, this long discussion about like women and power and then at the end the will comes back and and she feels that there's some sort of like trap you know and the whole the whole thing is a contained story. Um, 
or the story of like Euron, like and the and the king's move, like that's a, like a full story. Um, it works better with uh, with the previous chapter two kind of combined combined um, because of the the reference to the the hinge and stuff. But I think taking short bites like this, like one step at a time, baby steps to the elevator. I don't know if you ever seen What About Bob. Baby steps to the elevator. Baby steps to you know in the hallway. I think that's one of his strengths is to, to like go chapter by chapter, story by story. And then each chapter is just like fun. And you're thinking about the themes and like where you want the, the, the people to go. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's the, the, the uniqueness of George is that he treats, he treats most chapters like short stories. Um, and so I think that, um, I don't know. I think it makes the writing better, more, more exciting rather than it just being forgettable. Like what happened in the 12th chapter of, of whatever random book that you're, that you're reading? Like, how does it separate and designate itself from, from something else? Um, yeah. I mean, I started a script on a video about this and I was looking into like JK Rowling and I was looking into Tolkien and Stephen King and how they structure, how, how they structure their chapters. And it's just very different. Um, but you know, I think I think uh, it makes the writing better that way. I don't know if you're gonna write faster. <laughs> um, George is a secret dragon girlfriend. I doubt it. I doubt it. George R. R. Martin is uh, is very very dedicated to his uh, his wife. Um, <laughs> Preston criticizing the sloppy writing of Storm is setting back winds by another year. I mean, there's so much written. Like it, uh, George goes back and like tries to reconcile stuff when stuff doesn't work, you know, in order to like make up for the fact that like when he first wrote it, he realized it kind of kind of sucked. Um, so it does kind of slow him down because he just writes more to like explain it. No, 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 no. What I meant was, and this, and this actually works because, okay. You know, it's like all of the Star Wars books that like explain plot holes, like in Star Wars, you know, like they just kind of wrote and then like some other writer later tries to like make sense of it all. No, no, it, it makes sense that there would be an exhaust port that like blows up the whole station. And it's later expla explained in Rogue One that the, 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 that the, the designer of the Death Star like put that in you know, on purpose. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, how much access does a prince, i.e. Damon, have to his own wealth or treasury? Working a theory that he's the father of Adam and Alan and he funded Corlys. <sighs> that is a very good question. And I don't know... Um, I don't know if like George has thought about it too much about um, in feudalism and, and, and how these things work. So like generally speaking, if you're under this system where the eldest son just gets everything and everybody else gets nothing, you know, your the lands and incomes are all going to the eldest. And so these younger kids have nothing. And so you kind of say like, well, how would Damon have any income or wealth at all, right? He's not he's not the head of the feudal um, line. So like he's not getting like incomes and he doesn't have the crown's wealth or anything like that. Yeah, he's given like gifts. Maybe he's given a stipend from the king or something, or maybe he's given, maybe he's got jewelry lying around or something like that. But the thing is, is like, yeah, like how much wealth does Damon have? I would say the, the answer is probably very little. Um, I mean, he, he actively tries to get, tries to take his wife's land and is, and is denied. So he clearly saw advantage in it. He clearly wanted that wealth. Um, I don't think he has anything really. I, I think, you know, when you hear about it, he can like hire a few sell swords here and there. Um, but that's it. So I don't know. 
if he's fu- if he can possibly fund Corlys. Corlys is much richer, like much much richer than than uh, um, uh, than Damon. And we hear about Viserys funding Corlys's war in the Stepstones. We don't hear about Damon doing it. I don't think Damon has any money. I think he's poor, um, for the most part. I mean, relatively poor. He might have a bunch of fancy jewelry that he could hawk lying around, but I don't think he has that much. Um, I think everything is just kind of like given in a stipend. In fact, I even don't know like how it works for like Tyrion because Tyrion's going around betting in, in a Game of Thrones and stuff. And you're like, well, where is your money coming from? Like, does Tywin just give you a stipend? You know, who's who's getting that? Um, so. Um. Glytus Love, appreciate your Game of Thrones music ba- uh, breakdown. Which track would would uh, would be next? Glytus did write, did um create a very, a very good, very detailed um uh, analysis of of the Game of Thrones theme. Um, the uh, if you're if you're into music theory, it is it is a definite treat. Um, why did the world of ice and fire retcon the Andal invasion? Turns out there's werewoods all over the south, and most of the kingdoms intermarried with the Andals. Um, the world of ice and fire. I don't know. I'll briefly go into the history here. I was thinking about doing a video on this, but I don't know if I'm ever going to get around to it. So Elio and Linda. Um, went to George as early as 2007 and was like, we have an idea for like a history book where we just like create, like we, we invent all this like background lore based on the stuff in your, in your stories. And then maybe, you know, and the publishers were like, Oh, this sounds great. Another book. This, this, this is great. So very, very early on, there was this idea to create a history book based on, Ice and Fire, before Dance with Dragons was even out. And George was, on, George was on board, and he's like, okay, great, 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 great. So, and then it went more into, let me let me focus more on it when, when a Dance with Dragons is finished. And so Dance with Dragons gets finished, and it starts going into full steam. Okay, now we've got all this material to write, to, to and for the most part, if you read the, the World of Ice and Fire, the history point on the regions of, of Westeros, like it is just information from the book. There is hardly any new information. The new information in that book is mostly on Essos, which is just created, you know, and George is just like, fine, who cares? It's Essos. We're never going to go to these places. You want to write about Ib? Go write about Ib. Now, the weird thing came from like George's input. George decided he wanted to put in these sidebars um, on Targaryen history. So they they wanted like a basic like um, outline of Targaryen history, and then maybe there'd be some sidebars that George could put in, so that they could say George R. R. Martin was also the author of this. And then so George started writing these sidebars, and the sidebars became really really long, and so he he focused on the Dance of the Dragons, and it was just like he wrote the Princess and the Queen because he was just like writing sidebars for the World of Ice and Fire. And then, you know, he um, he also did it for like Sons of the Dragon, like that period. And then they released Princess of the Queen in Dangerous Women, and it was it was a really big success, like that. It sold really well. So they're like, "Oh crap, do you have another one of these?" And he's like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, I got the Rogue Prince." He had a bunch of sidebars for the Rogue Prince, so he tried to finish that up. But then they moved up rogues and and didn't give him enough time i mean he had like two years for princess and the queen and they gave him like six months for for rogues for for the rogue prince and so i'll I'll talk about this all day long about how the rogue prince just like it just falls fucking apart at the end because it was just it was built on some sidebars that he was writing for the world of ice and fire and then it just you know he had he had a deadline and he he really missed it which is why the rogue prince really sucks at the end. Um, 
And so then you just get like, I don't know, you're just like throwing stuff in where, where, I don't know, Elio and Linda are trying to reconcile stuff that's like in the text and they're writing stuff and George's writing sidebars and he's just writing. And they're, they're just trying to fill space and trying to get this out before a deadline. And, I, you know, there's so much that, that's in it that's rushed. Um, and there's that, this is why there's just so many problems with it in general. Um, I mean, Elio and Linda, like, they're trying to do their best to reconcile a bunch of stuff. And, and, um, and honestly, like, having so many years to put together this book, it should have been able to be put together. But, you know... George had a, George has his writing problems, you know. So, um, and without without them kind of like putting a fire underneath him, he wouldn't have had the World of Ice and Fire and Fire and Blood in general, and there wouldn't be freaking House of the Dragon. So, kind of in a way, like Elio and Linda pestering George produced all of this stuff. Oh, uh, now yeah, it distracted him from the Winds of Winter, but you know. There, a lot came out of it actually you know but um but why was there a retcon because george's writing doesn't make sense and it contradicts itself and so george just kind of puts in in uh a feast for crows that that you know all oh, the history can't be can't be really trusted you know um but you're right like it is a, it is a a uh a retcon that rather than the, the Andals just coming in and burning and getting rid of the first men, that the first men were, were intermarried and it wasn't so bad and all these werewoods survived. And it's just, um, I guess they went with something that was a little more logical than complete and utter ethnic cleansing of, of, uh, of Westeros or something, but it is, it is a retcon. It is a retcon. Cause originally it was like, the South was ethnically cleansed of all first men and their, and their, their werewoods were burned. And then it wasn't, you know? Um, uh, I guess it's just closer to actual, you know, European history or something where the, the Christians had to make compromises about um, conquest and, and, and religion and stuff. You can keep your gods, but you can, you got to ca start calling them saints now, you know. Um, uh, love you and Carmine. After listening to your brand chapter review, if Blood Raven doesn't have access to seeing the future, why wouldn't he kill Danny if his goal was to stop the birth of dragons? Um, I don't know if Blood Raven has eyes on Danny. Because Blood Raven has, he can see with through the werewood net, and so there's werewood. There aren't any werewoods in Essos, and there's you know he doesn't have crows out there. Um. So there is a question of whether or not Blood Raven even knows what's going on with Danny. Um. I mean, yes, Blood Raven says like may you know eventually be able to move beyond, like uh, the werewood, but. You know, how much can Blood Raven really see of Esos? We don't know. Like, we know Quaith has pretty good vision over Esos, but I don't know if Blood Raven does. Um, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Blood Raven just wrote the books and George R. R. Martin found them in the woods somewhere. Um, Fireball set aside his wife, uh, Quentin Ball. His spouse was unknown, Mystery Knight. Oh, right, for the... um. For the bastard. For Penny Jenny? What a horrible name. Redgrass Penny Jenny. Also known as Redgrass Jenny. Camp follower. Um, the 
I mean, I guess he 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 set her aside in the sense that uh, maybe he he started going after Penny Jenny, but it doesn't say he like remarried another person because I think you'd need um you'd need the uh, the high septon to set it aside, and that's if the the marriage is on is is not uh um uh you know they didn't actually have sex um because the thing is is like you know the more divorce and annulment you know you're, you're breaking down the entire feudal system uh davos is a white of some kind i think he died at the black one and was resurrected by the mother <clears throat> i think that's possible um Though, in his mind, he's still pretty there, right? Like, we don't get any sense that he's lost anything. Um, uh, between, that that would be the, the, the thing, the only thing against it, right? Is that he's, he doesn't seem, he hasn't lost, he, he hasn't had any experience of, of losing his personality through dying. Like Beric Thondarrion or, or, um, or, um, <laughs> <clears throat> uh, Lady Stoneheart. Um, I mean, it is still just a huge mystery on how Davos survives the Blackwater. Like, is it maybe it's just tide? He just got really lucky with the tides, you know? Like, <laughs> he was down under the water, and then just he just caught a log, and it took him to took him to some rocks. But it's a uh, it's one of those things where had the fandom been around, uh would they have expected Davos to have survived um, that one? Do you believe the Deep Ones actually exist or did exist on planet one, Planetos? Or did George R. Martin just throw them in for some extra lore flavor? Um, I think it's a bit of both. It's um, I think that George R. Martin uh, is, is saying that there was a pre- existing advanced civilization that planetos descended into and how people <clears throat> interpret that pre-existing civilization in their histories is going to change but um so i think that you know if we're talking like did, did the squishers exist did people really exist under the sea you know there might have been like an advanced civilization where where they had under underwater um you know living you know and and it's just been interpreted over time that that they uh that these are the deep ones or something i mean it's obviously a reference to 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 um uh, lovecraft and stuff like that but i think just the important thing is just that there was a pre-existing civilization the exact lore on who they were and what they were called, it kind of doesn't matter because at this point, when you're talking like 20,000 years, it just becomes legend at that point. So who cares? Um, did everyone watch Trey the Explainer's like video on um, Sissus uh, uh The pronunciation is, uh, um, is, uh, is, is, is something. But like, they, you know, people just invented this like, pharaoh that didn't even exist and that's only like um five six thousand years ago right so the idea that like you put something twenty thousand years ago in in the story like who knows what legends come from it i don't think it's that important to focus on like what the legends are but just that it's evidence that there was some sort of advanced civilization before everything and that we've descended into a uh, into um medieval times uh, thank you, Simon. A thousand yen from Japan. Um, the, uh, the Game of Thrones opening is so good. Yeah, it's really interesting um, going into the... Uh, I mean, I, I'd seen another video as well on... on not specifically the Game of Thrones theme, but on those sorts of like reoccurring melodies, it's like you're taking something very simple and then making it very complicated. But it's like 
Dun 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 and you're just you just that's what Game of Thrones is, but then you're like, okay, how can you make that boring thing um more interesting? Oh, let's put some little half steps in there. Dun dun da da dun dun da da dun dun da da dun dun da da dun dun and then from there all the different arrangements you can you can do and stuff like that. I mean uh, Gladys goes into it much better, but it's it's amazing how you can take something very simple and turn it into something very, very um, complicated and fun. But simple back, you know, the fact that like we can all sit here and go dun 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 dun, dun, dun and we all know what it is, you know. And it's true that like you never, you never skip the beginning of a Game of Thrones. Like you never skip the opening, ever. I never did it. Never did it. even on rewatches don't I don't skip it it's that good um I'm trying to think of another show where you just be like bosom buddies i'm trying to think of like shows where you just never skip the opening i think growing pains bosom buddies uh game of thrones <laughs> like i skip the beginning of Westworld all the time. Like it's a beautiful song, but it's, 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 and it's the same. It's the same composer, but like, it's not the same. It's not the same as Game of Thrones. Um, I mean, granted there's, there's cool, there's much better visuals too at the beginning of Game of Thrones with the map and everything, but you know, just a, a beginning where you're just like, no, I'm just, I'm never going to skip that because it's just like, um, the great American hero, greatest American hero. You'll probably never skip that. If you ever watch that show. Believe it or not, I'm walking on air. You know, you're never going to skip that. Why Why would you? The whole reason you're watching the show is to hear that theme. It was the same with Booze and Buddies. Like, no one, Booze and Buddies wasn't that good of a show, but the opening theme was, you know, was, uh, was the Billy, Billy Joel. Um, What theory of yours is your favorite? I love the Littlefinger debt scheme and time traveling brand ones, but the Brienne series had a huge effect on my identity politics. Oh, that's interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Um, what do I think? I'm trying to think like, what is my, like, um, you know, I've been thinking about, I, you know, I've thought about like some of my, my good videos and some of my ones that aren't so good. Um, I realized, for example, like, the the timing of John stabbing, although I think it's like very like very detailed deductive work that I've put out, it, I've explained it horribly, and it's the most confusing thing to to like listen to. Um, so that's like, I think one of my worst videos is is the timing of John stabbing. Not that it's like it's not like you know great that I've done all this analysis to figure out that 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 the, the timelines don't work out, but it's just like. There's no, like it's, I've explained it in the most complicated way, way possible. So I think like my favorite videos, I mean, I really love the, the, the red wedding or the purple wedding video. Um, not just for its opening, but also just because I think I've explained everything very well and it's put together in a very, you know, uh, animated, like well way, uh, a good way. I think killing brand is very good. Um, I do think like, uh, Dornish Master, or Deeper Dorn is probably the most fun. Like if you're just like looking for the most entertaining thing where you're just like, whoa, Deeper Dorn, I, I, I really like. But I, I also like, you know, I like a lot of the new ones. I like, you know, I think the Brienne, I think Brienne, I did, I'm proud of that one. Um, uh, I think Time Traveling Brienne. I think some of them like, uh, I like Secrets of Craster's Keep. Um, I don't know. I'm just naming, naming random ones, but, um, but, uh, time traveling brand's a pretty good one. I also think page of lies came out pretty well. Um, but, uh, the, uh, some of them, some of them are, some of them are hits and some are misses. No, no one ever praises me for, uh, riverlands of the dragon, you know, or, <laughs> um, George R. Martin uh, has to write more Dunkin' Egg now because of the Dunkin' Egg series. Will we ever get wins? We all know Dream of Spring is Dream of Spring is a dream, but I still have faith for wins. Um, 
I don't think we're going to get wins. I don't. Um, will we get another Duncan Eggs series? That one is probably the most likely. Um, I think that there's there's a higher probability for for um, for Fire and Blood Part Two and another Duncan Egg story than um, wins. Now, the thing is, is George has a lot of time to write another Duncan Egg story um, or two. You know, he can say, "Well, okay, you know." The Hedge Knight is coming out in 2025. Maybe the Sworn Sword in 2026, 2027. Um, uh, and then the Mystery Knight, 2028, 2029, something like that. I mean, keep in mind, like, George is going to be pushing 80 at that point. Um, maybe he might feel obligated to do She-Wolves of Winterfell. He has that story, like, structured down pretty well. But, um, you know, to actually sit there and write it is a problem, you know, is an issue. Will he do that? You know, he could. He could. He could. I would, I would put the probability of getting She-Wolves of Winterfell at this point higher than than the Winds of Winter. Um, but no, I don't I don't think we're going to get wins. I mean, there's a chance, but I just don't I don't think it's going to happen. Um, it's it's. Uh, it's just I don't know, it's like. Even the end of even when like a dance with dragons was nearly done, it was nearly done for a couple of years, and you were getting these like positive messages like oh nearly done, almost there. We we don't we we have radio silence on that, so no, I don't think I don't think um, I don't know. I mean, who knows? But it's just like there's two there's so many things going on, and like I say, like George probably has something personal going on, and then he's got all of this other work. Hello, hello. How, how's it going? Your problem is, is that attitude. We'll never get winds of winter with that attitude. Really? It, it, so you think like my positive, wishful thinking can in can can resolve resolve the issue, dude? Like. <sighs> I'd maybe, maybe it's possible. Maybe if we okay. all collectively wished for it. it, it uh, could here, be here's a challenge. I was actually thinking about this. Mm. Um, hold on a second. I'm trying to think. When did Wizard and Glass come out? Wizard and Glass came out in '97, and then Wolves of Kala was. 2003 so that was six hmm. years what was between what was the distance between drawing of the three drawing of the three came out in 87 no there's still it's just not nothing nothing really comparable um if anyone can tell me like give me an example of a book that took a decade to come out, but but finally came out, um, where a writer was having trouble, but then they finally completed it after a decade. Um, I mm. you know, I'm just wondering if like there are examples of people coming out or coming back after uh, after a situation like this, you know. Does anyone, does, you know, are there any, any cases where a decade, where a, a writer's been working on something for a decade and then they finally, they finally complete it? Um, I don't know. I'd love, I'd love, I'd love that example. Cause like, if you, if you, if you instead like bring up lists of like famous, like unfinished series, you find either the author died in the middle of writing or they had some sort of personal problem that interfered with them finishing and they never finished. Um, uh, like, um, I'm trying to think. <laughs> Someone said the Holy Bible. <laughs> the Holy Bible. <laughs> why did that get me so much? I don't know why. That's funny. 
Um, can you and Carmine talk about Dunkin' Egg? How are they going to make one novella into a whole season? Remind me of the Hobbit movie. Um, so I'm that's going... what I wanted to talk to you about, by the way. Oh, you want to talk about Dunkin' Egg? Yeah. All right. Let's let, uh... let me go to the bathroom. I'll be right back. Hold on a second. Sure, 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 sure. Keep, keep them entertained, Carmine. Oh, I hate being put on a spot like this. I hate when you put me on the spot like this. By the way, um, because we're on the topic of fantasy authors, uh, we did a live stream recording. Um, some of you guys who are patrons and YouTube members on my end as well, you guys already saw it. Uh, but we kind of talk about uh, Tolkien and like, you know, Mount Rushmore of fantasy writers. That's coming out soon. I think he might be posting that Monday, Tuesday, or, or Wednesday. So, uh Carmine, I saw you in a Crystal Legacy stream. Yeah, that was uh, you. You guys will find me randomly in other YouTube videos all the time. Whenever I enjoy a YouTube video, I will comment like good shit. So if you do see me in the comment sections, feel free to say hi. Carmine, tell us about Calzones. <laughs> Mods, ban that man. Ban that man immediately. Thank you. All right, I'm 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 coming back. I'm coming back. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Okay. <laughs> what did what what did you what did you say to everybody while they were gone? Nothing. So uh, yeah. So <laughs> I had to suffer. I had to suffer through Dragon Demand's video on the topic. And I, I, I did. I, wa I, I watched. This... I watched Dragon Demand's video as well. Oh, then why, why did you fucking tell me that I didn't have to fucking do? <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, hold on. Let me explain this real quick. I like Dragon Demands, and you you know I do. Even privately, I've said it. And I've said this to him privately, too. I just wish he scripted his videos, because he mm. likes to jibber-jabber a lot. And, yeah, yeah. You know, so. But um, in his video, apparently, this is back from April 14th, um, George R. R. Martin said about the Dunkin' Egg thing, mm, our yeah. premiere season will be an adaptation of the first of the three published novellas, The Hedge Knight, mm. the tale of how Dunk and Egg first met during the tourney uh, at Ashford Meadow. So it's just so basically the first season is the first novella, the first book. Yeah. Um, now we're talking about like ad adapting six episodes of The Hedge Knight. Of, of any of them, The Hedge Knight is going to be the hardest to adapt. With, with the Storm Sword... There's at least like, and and with um, Mystery Night, the Mystery Night, there's at least like a journey to the 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 events and 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 stuff like that. It's still difficult to come up with like what you're gonna do the whole time. Mm. Born Sword is the same. Like, there's some back and forth, like traveling to Rohan Weber's castle and back, and before the eventual like climax in the river and things like that. But, um. But it is. It does seem like compared to how much like material they burn through, um, in 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 Game of Thrones and House of the Dragon, like it, you know, House of the Dragon is is based on um, almost seventy pages of Fire and Blood, um, and over the course of like thirty, you know, a thirty year. Um, is it a 30 year? How, how much time goes by? 105 to 129. So 25, 25 year time period. And then, um, you know, Game of Thrones is just like blisteringly fast, right? When you think about how much is being adapted in that first season, like every episode is, you know, a hundred, you know, hundred pages. Um, how are they going to do it with the hedge knight? Uh, a lot of action. <laughs> someone, someone in the stream chat said they could do what they did with Lord of the Rings, where it's just a lot. You, you know, mm -hmm. in hindsight, I hated stuff. this. Huh? A lot of extra stuff, like added on. Uh, basically, um, not extra stuff, but just people walking around. Now, I hated this in Wheel of Time, but I mm. loved it in Lord of the Rings. I, I just don't know what is so different about the two what, what, in regards to people just traveling and walking around. Maybe it's the, the music. Maybe it's just the atmosphere. Maybe just New Zealand is fucking amazing. Mm. But there's just something about Lord of the Rings where the characters are just traveling and walking to their destination and everything around them is just so just, ah, uh, I, I never get bored. I never get bored of them just fucking yeah. traveling. 
But in every other thing, I'm just like, eh, whatever. They could do that with Dunkin' Egg, you know, pad it out a little bit, maybe an original adventure and all that. Why not? So, I mean, I'm I'm even trying to think of like how you how you would take the story and put it into six episodes. Okay, the sixth episode, you have the whole episode be the trial by combat, the entire thing, just like one big, like, you know, battle, like the Battle of the Bastards. (laughs) and then the and then the aftermath so that's that's episode six that's then, episode six that wouldn't be episode five and then six is like easing out into the next season because that's normally how it happens episode okay. nine the penultimate episode is usually the big battle one and then okay. episode 10 is everything calms down a little aftermath. bit to set it up for next season okay yeah. okay okay so six episode six is aftermath episode five is the trial by combat um episode four is Dunk searching for people to be in his, to be part of his seven, like him going one by one and like trying to find them. Um, episode three, it would be like ending with his, with his fight with Arian bright flame. Okay. Um, and so then, or maybe you need, maybe you need to do like episode two be Arian Bright Flame and episode three be like the aftermath of like everyone discussing what's going to happen and the reveal of who of who um, Egg is and then episode one just being like yeah episode one is like Dunk arrives and he meets Egg at the end and then episode I two. Yeah, episode one is like Dunk arrives. We get, we we inter- we get introduced to a lot of the characters. We get introduced to the puppeteer. We get introduced to um, the environment. You get flashbacks maybe to like Dunk's life with like Arlen Pennytree, and then you end with him like meeting the boy. And you need some sort of shock, so maybe it reveals to the audience that he's actually a Targaryen. You know, um, somehow. Mm. And that that be the that be the shock. Then episode two, now that we've established like everything, we have we have uh, him again. You know, I don't know, being around and then getting in his fight with Arian Bright Flame at the end, and then um, ending on a big shock, like ending with people's arms broken and whatever. Episode three, the aftermath, him talking um, to people about. I mean, it's almost too much for episode three to be the aftermath, but like, and then episode four is him find, searching for the people to be part of his trial. And then the trial is episode five and six is the aftermath to that. But that's still a lot. It's still, it's still really stretching it out. You, you know, you know how you really uh, episode one, because we need time to we need to spend time with Dunk to care about him. So episode one would have to be at least an hour and 30 minutes. And then episode six would also have to be over an hour. Mm. None of that bullshit where it's like, you know, 50. It, it, it says it's an hour and 20, but it's really like 45 minutes. 15 yeah. minutes is like, you know, this like the behind the scenes shit. And then 30 minutes is just, you know, the actor's bullshit and like i don't i don't care about that yeah we need a I mean, very or big you could you could do the closed. you could do episode one just be like dunk's backstory the whole thing like how he gets on the road you deal with the death of arlen penny tree and all of that like you just and then at the end he's like on his own but the, i don't know what you'd find for that much to do in that in that episode but you know you, i don't know you, there's you just find a lot of distractions i mean it's 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 westeros it's game of thrones so it's just like for some reason this this um the uh the tourney is now going to be just filled with prostitution and like dicks and sex <laughs> you know it's going to be like the yay of, it's going to be like the streets of king's landing and in, in house of the dragon like all of a sudden king's landing is the doth is like filled with dothraki like that's what's gonna happen <laughs> right it's exactly what happened right they're like oh my gosh when did <laughs> as long as there's no stupid exp- uh, exposition that uh, uh, Missaria gives to Damon, you are a Damon Targaryen, uh, the owner of Dark Sister. Okay, <laughs> okay. What's the, the thank you yeah. for that? The, thank I you. needed to know this. By the thank way, you. um, what I also thank, wanted to bring you. up with you. Thank you, woman. Thank you, woman from across the narrow sea who 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 is a sex worker. It's straight. You seem to care a lot about the the. About Valyrian swords <laughs> and thinks it's impressive who owns them. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
the one thing I want to discuss with you is, and, and we've just, and we've said this ad nauseum, how HBO, mm -hmm. we, there's a whole Patreon thing, how HBO has almost nothing set up for 2000 yeah. and 20, uh, 2024, 2025, mm -hmm. um, and how House of the Dragon in 2024 is going to be their big bet. I yeah. think Dunkin' Egg is going to be their big bet for 2025 because mm -hmm. according to Redanian Intelligence, which by the way, if you're not following them, follow them on Twitter. They got some good news on there. Um, Dunkin' Egg prequel casting call suggests filming sooner than expected. So yes. HBO is getting a little desperate here. They need oh, stuff. Absolutely. And I think they're they're filling the hole. Like this is the thing is like when when – listening to, to dragon demands like dragon demands um he's very hopeful about stuff he's he, like sometimes he's like i really actually hope it gets delayed so that like they really spend their time on it and like it, it's perfect you know like he, he he has these kinds of attitudes like and i'm just like they're looking to get something out like you got to think about it in a money situation there's no way that they're going to delay house of the dragon a day when their entire 2024 is empty you know, they're, they're not like I, I, I agree with him that it probably would be better if they delayed and took some time and did their proper reshoots. But they are fucking desperate right now. Right. So did you see their casting call for dunk? Like what they're looking for? They're looking for oh, yeah. someone who's like super tall, any ethnicity. And I'm going to be ethnicity. very honest with you. I kind of want even though this is very rare. I kind of want a very tall Asian person to play Dunk because shake mm. it the fuck up. We have a lot of white people characters. We have a black people characters. We mm. got a couple of Hispanic characters. I don't yeah. think we have one named Asian actor character in Ice and Fire adaptations. I don't think there's one. And before you go, Missaria, I don't know what the actress is. I thought Missaria's. I, I mean, I thought it was Missaria's black, but um, I Missaria actress. Um, we had oh, no. um i'm trying to think like east asians we had i mean named ones we had a random woman in volantis oh no i'm wrong um soyona mizuno she's a japanese-born english actress yeah but misaria sucks give us a better character oh like, misaria, yeah not... misaria is half japanese right i didn't know that never mind that's that sucks. she's well, Bra give us brazilian brazilian japanese or something what is it yeah no british <laughs> Brit but british brazilian japanese where are it, you getting it, brazilian where is i that? swear man i i might be I making that up but argentinian i'm up. sorry i'm sorry that i confused it with argent argent argentinian oh i'm surprised it's argentine she's argentinian english oh oh i see her her mother is half english half argentine yeah the, re the reason the reason i assumed brazilian is because brazil has quite a large japanese population but she's actually argentinian half argentinian mm -hmm. but, uh, um yeah 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 um but uh it would be nice to have minorities that are portrayed that aren't um sex workers can we have any of those <laughs> Can we can we have that? Can we? I mean, the Valar the Valarians are it, but like it's just too much of an opportunity to. I mean, I kind of agree with what Dragon Man said. Like, if you can make him ethnically ambiguous, be, to 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 lean into the fact that like, um, Dunk's heritage is is ambiguous. But the thing is, they're really going to go for who's the best actor, and I think they're go they are going to lean into trying to to trying to hire a minority. Um, in it because they, they just need one in the lead role. Cor Corlys Valarian is the closest they've had. So um they you know they'd probably they'd probably like uh they'd probably like to 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 hire a hire my, hire my And friend. out of all the non white actors who are like main characters, he's the least interesting. Lenor was more interesting, Vaymond was more interesting, Lena for like five seconds of that episode six before she dies was was more interesting. Everybody was more interesting. <sighs> I mean, I, you know, I didn't think he was bad. I mean, I liked him. I liked no, him the actor more. was great, but yeah, just yeah. the character. The lines, characters. the lines given to him were not great. Um, the lines given to him were not great because he's, you know, he's, he's given one motivation. Like, like I, I care about my name. Okay. And, and doing whatever my wife says. <laughs> <laughs> I saw someone say, "Hey, I saw someone say, Preston, why don't you audition? Would you say? Which I, I I barely heard. I said, I said maybe I could be I could be Sir Eustace Osprey. <laughs> <laughs> Time has passed for that, baby. Time is well passed. Uh, thank you, Simon. Uh, 
really enjoying the fanfic. I like how the story continues to grow and twist. The way the show tried to wrap things up seemed wrong and un somehow. Do you know what I mean? I do know what you mean. I think that the way the show wrapped things up is that they were checkboxing everything. Like things needed to happen. And they're like, we need to have this reveal and we need, we need this character to be someplace. But they didn't have all of the... Um, they didn't have all of the emotional weight and change to the characters and the impact with everything, you know, that, that, that took, that, that takes time to really, um, uh, you know, enjoy, uh, I don't know if joy is the right word, but take something like the death of Masaria. Um, um, I mean, not Masaria, the death of, of, uh, Miss Sandy. Um, the death of Miss. By the way, earlier when I was like, I thought, but I thought Masaria was black. It was because I, I thought you, I thought I was confusing Miss Sande with Masaria. So that's what was actually going on in my head. A lot of M names. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, when you think about like the death of Miss Sande, like, yeah, there, like that's a big like, um, like angry turn. But then there's like there's no time to breathe and really take it in that this kid, that this character is like gone and like what that means for, for gray worm and Danny and everything like, you know, some, some, some real time, like, you know, no monologue was given like, you know, about, about it or like even Jora, like, and things like this, like the amount of time or, or Theon, like, you know, you've got Sansa like going over and like giving a pin, but you know, we don't know how it affects Asha. We don't know how it affects everybody else that lived with that lived with Theon for for years. Like, how does it affect John? How, you know, we don't know. We don't know. It's just Sansa. Sansa was sad. You know, that's that's it. Um, so because it was very very fast, and we didn't have the emotion, the proper emotional time to process everything that was happening at once. They were. It just felt like the pieces were getting moved to where they needed to be. Um, to wrap things up now at least it did wrap things up maybe <laughs> at least um to give a compliment it, it wrapped things up uh badly but you know. <laughs> um though so one of the advantages carmine of of uh duncan egg is the fact that it's low cost compared to yeah i know other- we We've discussed this like so much. I, we also discussed that I haven't like gone into Dunkin' Egg. That's the one mm. ice and fire thing. I don't really know too much about. That's I know the basics, bad, but too bad you're missing. Out. I'm I'm gonna read the comics. I'm downloading them. I'm, uh, or also, if I can it, find the audio book. It's fucking narrated by Harry Lloyd. Like fucking just Dude. fucking. Why would you? Yeah. Why would you not like? Uh... Finding the audio book for this fucking thing is a little difficult. I didn't expect it to be that. I, I found that one with Lena Headey. You told me about to to capture her voice, mm-hmm. but I, I can't find this fucking guy Harry Lloyd doing this. I'm trying. Oh Harry Lloyd. Oh he, Harry Lloyd. Um, it's no longer on YouTube. Damn it. Wait, it's on YouTube. I. <laughs> Some asshole uploaded that to YouTube. Show me. Um, yeah, I mean, I see something entitled "The Hedge Knight" by G- G- George R. R. Martin, full audiobook. I'm not sure. Link it to um, me. If it's if it's, uh, <laughs> it's I don't know if it's uh, if it's that's the Harry Lloyd version because I know that there's another one, but not, not to mention the. The incredible efforts of David Reed's A Song of Ice and Fire. Um, but just what a what Is David a Reed's the guy with, where his cat meows where his randomly? Cat, where his cat's meowing through most of it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But he's, but fucking, yeah, but God bless him. God bless him, you know? <laughs> like, he's like, I'm sick of copyright people like taking down A Song of Ice and Fire off of YouTube. I'm just going to freaking read the whole thing. <laughs> Oh my God! They can still take it down, but it doesn't hit algorithms. So, like, that—that's it. Incredible, incredible, dude. Um, and he's not bad. He's not bad. I—I I mean, he's not. I, I listen to it faster, um, one point two five, but or one point five or something, you know. But he's—he's he's not bad. Um, could it be that it was really Ghost was stabbed while John was working? <laughs> oh fuck that's a funny thought that's a very funny thought let me let me let me bring up i don't think so because i think it 
he um they describe him like himself going to his knees right i mean that's a very funny thought that like you actually go into um the dire wolf's point of view at that point and um that that'd be a funny that's very funny okay <clears throat> let's let's uh let's get the the very last line john fell to his knees he found the dagger's hilt and wrenched it free in the cold night air his wound was smoking ghost he whispered pain washed over him sticking with the pointy end when the third dagger took him between the shoulder blades, he gave a grunt and fell face first into the snow. He never felt felt the fourth knife, only the cold. Um, <clears throat> no, so clearly, like John falling to his knees is John. It's named as John. He found the dagger's hilt and wrenched it free. I don't know if a dire wolf would be able to do that. Like he'd be able to. He'd have to be like with his paws in the cold night air. The wound was smoking. That could be anybody, but um, ghost, he whispered. Obviously, ghost can't ac actually talk. Now, if mid-paragraph, at this point, we switch to ghost, pain washed over him, sticking with the pointy end is now thinking, so it can be John, too. When the third dagger took him between the shoulder blades, he gave a grunt and fell face first into the snow. He never felt the fourth knife, only the cold. <sighs> I mean, I suppose wolves have shoulder blades. Um, and he's conflating the count from John to him. And he, I guess he's got a face, face first into the snow. He never felt the fourth knife, uh, only the cold. Um, I mean, it could be, but John is still stabbed. So it's like, I could only, the only way I could interpret that, there's a possibility that the third and fourth knife are actually in Ghost, but the first and second knife are clearly in John. Like, I think that's just, uh, I mean, fun to think about, but yeah, oh well. It is. <laughs> I'm not making a word for it. <laughs> um... The Brienne series is really touching. Your take on feminism and existentialism evoke Michael Brooks level genius should be in media literacy class. Oh, thank you. I mean, I, you know, I thought I was just, um, I thought I was just kind of like examining what like George was really saying, you know? Um, but yeah, I think, I think that George's structure of things is really ingenious. Cause I do think it's George's idea that he's saying that the entire war system um, is dependent upon and, and subjugation of, of boys and sending off little boys to war um, uh, is reliant on concepts like George doesn't use it, but today we would, we would talk about it as toxic masculinity and, and needing women to play this other role and things like that in order for, you know, you need to, you need to, you know, take, all of women and shove them into this like caretaker needing to be defended role in order for the men to be the protectors in this harsh world. Um, and then for for those boys to be, you know, sent off to war and, and, and sacrificed in war and that the entire structure is, is built this way. Um, and that it all relates together when we're talking about like the class problems and the sex problems and, and and war and and all of this. I mean, today we'd also use words like intersectionality and stuff like that. George is just doing it. He's just making all of the connections free of all of this kind of lingo and ideas. He's just like, no, this all kind of makes sense. That that the entire um, by by putting people in these roles, forcing this weird version of masculinity on men, and forcing this weird version of femininity on women, like increases the cycle of increases the cycle of war that that we need to we need to raise our men to be men and be to be harsh and it's like well what happens when you raise your your men to be to be harsh well don't they end up being harsh you know don't they create a harsh system and things like this um 
you know, but I need my kid to be tough to endure the world. But then you're you're feeding back into the cycle and things like that. But yeah, I, I you know, I think I think George, I think the Brienne series, I think the Brienne chapters uh, are perhaps George's best written chapters in the entire uh, entire series, um, where he's thought about the themes and the the, the journey of Brienne makes sense and everything um, going through it. I mean, I always compare this like when I read the Tyrion chapters of A Dance with Dragons and I'm like, wow, this is going fucking nowhere versus like Brienne, which has a very like a very set like designated desti- destination um, and is saying something the entire time thematically. You know, people people throw them together. They're like, oh, travel logs. George R. R. Martin and his travel logs. Well, there's a big difference between the Brienne travel log and the Tyrion travel log. You know, one is meandering. And pointless and the other like has a very specific destination before um, you move on from this super chat i have to ask you because i know so many fucking youtubers who get who get gassed up by comments like that and then they hmm. panic they're like fuck i can't top this i can't top this next one i can't top this one that i did because this guy right here is basically saying like this is fucking phenomenal hmm. and i don't want to say you've peaked with that Brienne series, but do you feel like you have? Like, do you feel like, oh, fuck, uh, I can't stop this? Maybe. I mean, I'm, I might have, like, but it's also a function of, like, like, if Brienne has the most to say about it and there's then there's the most analysis to do about Brienne, like, you know, where do you, where do, where do you go from there? Like, um, it's just the, it's the, it's the, the best case of a, of a, of a really well put together like limited series like you can you can analyze brand but like brand's not finished and you you know you can analyze danny but danny isn't finished you know um some people analyze quentin as like as like a quest that might be finished but even that doesn't really work that well because the in order to the analysis the analysis I've, I've seen of of quentin assuming quentin is dead um like to forget like 90 percent of the quentin story and just focus on like some thinking that he does right before he goes off and takes the dragon and like the very beginning of the merchant's man. So you like take these like slim, these two moments where he's talking about being the hero of a story and adventure and then forgetting like all of the rest of the fucking Quentin story. Um, well, Brienne, like everything is so, is so important to, to, to the thematic part, you know, thematic story, but I don't know. I mean, did I, did I peek with it? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. You know what? I'll, I'll be very honest. I, th- I think the very peak that you will ever reach is that video you plan on doing on, on why Return of the Jedi sucks. <laughs> that is going to be. By the way, someone Maybe. someone in my server was dragging you. I'm going to try to find this. This fucking guy did not. For those of you who are curious, we did a um, Star Wars tier list. Uh, somewhat kind of dumping on Star Wars theory for his tier list. And uh, there was someone in my server who had a problem with your analysis of Return of the Jedi. I won't go into it now with you, but mm. <laughs> they were very upset with you. It's not that bad. It's that them. bad. It's that bad, but I understand that people's emotion. Like you grow up on something <laughs> and it's and it's this like it's this this thing that people pop in front of you as a kid and you're gonna get emotionally attached to it. Like don't get me wrong. Like, you know, like I understand that emotion. Like you know, um, but you just kind of have to like also accept that, like if you step back and look at the movie, it sucks dick. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me of how people are emotionally attached to Howlin' Reen being the High Sparrow, and they just it just it's just a, it's a shitty theory. Like you can't get. By the way, that's your next video after Return of the Jedi sucks. How why Howlin' Reed is an asshole? What? Well, yeah, it's true. It's true. It's true. I know. I know. Um, and maybe that's how they'll pad out, uh, uh, hedge Knight. It'll just have a random, random story about how Lynn Reed in the middle or something, fill it in with like weird <laughs> backstory. That's like the Hobbit, right? They're just like, they're just like filling in stuff with random times. <laughs> um, shaving kids for gigs in Hollywood is bad, right? Um, I mean, this is the, the idea that we take like older kid, older people and have them play younger people. Is that the, uh. No, no, we were talking about, uh, he's talking about uh, uh, Egg, how you, you need a kid that could be bald. They did it oh. with the, what's what's the, what's the girl from Stranger Things? Uh, Eleven, I Eleven, forgot her name. Yeah, the, yeah they did Brown. it with her. Like, there it is. They could do it with fucking, you know, they could, 
Again, Shay was fucking kid's head. They did it with the fucking kid from Avatar in, in the upcoming Avatar show and in the that's movie. True. The one that that's sucked. true. Um, I mean, and let's be honest, like shaving a boy's head is, I mean, it grows back in, in, in a month. I mean, it's not that big a deal. It's not that big a deal. Like shaving a woman's head, like, you know, she's, she's got a long time before that hair is coming back. Um, you know, so, uh, I mean, it's, I think it's just the grander question of like using child actors. Like what does child acting do to people? But, um, do they, do, are they, does a nine-year-old really, really understand what's going on in his life and, and what it's going to do with him? What, what, what's going to happen to him? Like, and I just think of Jake Lloyd, you know, or any of the, any of these childhood actors, um, uh, which is, you know, how do you, how do you then portray children if you're not going to use a child actor? But man, I guess there just, there, there needs to be more, more guidelines on, on, I don't know, um, how many hours they can work if, and exploitation and, and who gets their money and stuff like that. It's really tough. If the internet had their way, Danny DeVito would play every child character in Hollywood. <laughs> yeah. I mean, their way. occasionally get lucky. Like there's that girl in, um, from the walking dead who looks like who played a 16 year old and she's like 30. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, no, I zoned out of the walking dead. Which one? The blonde one from the farm. Yeah. 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 The blonde girl. Um, Fuck walking dead blonde girl. I should know this. Elizabeth. Beth. I think her name's Beth. Beth. Wait, Beth is supposed to be 16. Yeah. Huh? Really? Yeah, the act the, the the character was supposed to be sixteen, but the actress was like was like pushing thirty. Ooh. Not, yeah, it was not great. Kidding. It was it was I mean, she did a really good job. Like she was she was phenomenal at like putting on the insecurity of a sixteen year old and like getting it down. Like she was she was uh she was really great. Um and then they, they killed her off. I mean <laughs> I grew up in the nineties where 30 year olds played teenagers on power rangers i mean like i'm cool with it. whatever yeah i mean it's so funny because the actress now is 39 years old 39 years old um and when she was playing beth she was uh what the walking dead she was in walking dead from 2011 to 2015 so she was like late 20s to 30 over that period yeah but uh <clears throat> um who's stannis's legit heir after shireen um so i've been thinking about various funny things for the uh for the for the fanfic and i was thinking about um asha's pregnancy and I was realizing like, oh my gosh, what if Asha, like, let's say Stannis like disappears or dies and Asha like goes around telling people that she had sex with Stannis and that she said she has Stannis's heir inside her. And that when she has her baby, she's like, this is Stannis's heir. Like, isn't that a really like kind of interesting idea? <laughs> like, you know, like, cause I feel like that bait, like, like, I don't know. Like you feel like Asha having unprotected sex and not taking, not taking moon tea. Um, you feel like that th that's a plot point that's going to come back. Right. Carmine, do you think this is going to come back? Asha? Do you think she's pregnant? Check off gun. You can't just, oh, well, no, they didn't mention it. Um, wait, did they mention it? Cause Asha, well, think they, they mentioned, they meant, she mentions, she mentions that, that, um, Carl, the maid comes inside her and she says, Oh, I better, I better drink some moon tea. And then they're they're set upon by yeah. yeah. Um Huh. Yeah, that has to come back unless Right. It's but then be again, those... she's she's I want to say that like the sacrifice chapter and everything were about 3 months in and she hasn't mentioned it in her in her um she's not 3 months. It's like 2 months and some change. Um uh since since uh maybe 70 70 days or something yeah you know. she would have to mention if she was late she would have to right she doesn't have to i mean people can mention whatever they want in their in their chapters um and maybe she's mm. just forgotten about it 
or something, you know, but um, it's, uh, but, you know, like a lot of time went into that sex scene. <laughs> it's, Too um, much time. And so like, <clears throat> but what's the point of Asha being pregnant? Like, especially with a bastard, you know? So, you know, I feel like Asha claiming that it's somebody else's, whether it's Justin Massey's or whoever, like plays into something. But I'm like, Justin Massey, though, having Justin Massey's bastard baby, what is that? What does that do you? Who who actually brings you some power? And it's like, oh, God, Stannis claiming Stannis's bastard is um is more is more interesting is more interesting if she could pull that off you know hmm but after shireen i probably somebody on on estermont house estermont would have a claim it would be it would be there'd be claimants but it'd probably be somebody from house estermont would be the uh would be the heir after shireen but it doesn't matter house estermont is captured by the golden company so they can't do they can't do anything really um, uh, Brand chapter was incredible, but I was confused at the ending. Were all the corpses part of a vision or actual physical, physical corpses of, of Brand clones? I thought about the consciousness traveled back in time. Yeah, it's the consciousness that's traveling back in time. It's only a vision. There aren't. There isn't literally a a room with with uh, with um, thousands of of dead bodies in it. No, it's it's a <clears throat> it's a vision because he is because Bran when when Bran receives visions from the the three when from time traveling Bran from the three eyed crow their minds are blended and so in a sense like Bran is seeing memories and visions of time traveling Bran and so or whatever time traveling Bran wants to send Bran um, if he wants to communicate that that he's in a loop he can send him this loop. You know, this is like saying like uh, it's in the same respect as like, oh, was there actually a big stone giant standing over Sansa and Arya whose visor went up and had blackness underneath? Well, no, that was part of a vision, you know, but, but keep in mind that Bran has already seen what we see at the end of the Bran chapter. He already saw it in A Game of Thrones. He already flew over the spires and saw uh, saw the dead dreamers. He's already seen this. So like the ending is just reshowing the the vision from a Game of Thrones in more detail, but it's just it's just a vision. It's just a vision. But now he's up close and he's seeing that all of these people are are, are him. Um, Ironically, I hit you up and asked you the same thing. I don't know if you yes, remember true. that. I hit you Carmine, up. Carmine was I actually had, had the same feeling. He's like, "What? How are all these bodies down there?" You know. I remember. I um. I finally remember the uh, the movie where there was a bunch of clone like dead clones. It was one of the Resident Evil films. So dumb. I think it was a third Resident Evil film where there was like a bunch of Alice's clone bodies like dumped in a ditch or something. And I'm like, where did you get guys get that from? Where where, where did that idea come from? Mm-hmm. The, the whole all the the different brands from like the different timelines. Was that like you or did you get it from like a movie? Um. I don't know. I, I, I was just thinking about how time travel would work and what systems would work. And I, in, in the end, I think ground, like the Groundhog's Day loop just kind of made made the most sense. And then and then at some point, using that loop and, 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 and the vision from A Game of Thrones, seeing all the dead dreamers out there, like those two ideas just kind of came together for me. I don't know. I don't know where exactly the, the idea came from. I mean, it's just, you know, but... I mean, it, it it was an idea I've had a long time that when I put out the brand, like, like, I think, I think things. I know where you might've gotten it from. Do you mind if I like spitball sure. that at you? There was the, for season eight, there was a promo for uh, game of Thrones season eight where a uh, long claw was hmm. in the snow. And it, it, it almost as though like John had been defeated and like he dropped his sword and like, yeah. So the, the idea when that came out was that, um, the show season eight would have been about how the white walkers ultimately win, but Bran is able to send the idea of how mm. to maybe beat them like to another like timeline or something. And then we right, right. immediately go to that timeline 
and that's the timeline we follow. The original timeline where we experience the entire show is gone because the White Walkers won. So now we're mm. in the new timeline, and yeah, yeah Bran was able to transmit I the mean, ideas. Keep in mind, though, even my book, like the world, the the dreams of Ghosts and Robins, like deals with time travel and like alternate timelines and stuff. So like, it's not that I haven't been thinking. I mean, I've been watching sci-fi for fucking you know 40 45 years so like you know there's obviously like you know time travel and time paradoxes have always been something that i've been, been kind of thinking about but um you know just trying to trying to think about what would make sense uh for george um in, in the in these in these ideas you know uh and and the thing that made sense the most was a was a was a was a groundhog stay loop where the consciousness is getting sent back in time and the consciousness stuff comes from George's previous, previous um, writings. I would have never thought about consciousness, time travel, if George hadn't been writing about consciousness, time, tra time travel. So like I'm taking that aspect of George and then trying to like relate it to what, what I think makes sense. Um, I bet Brazilian Japanese food is 10 out of 10. I actually went to a Japanese restaurant in, in Brazil. Man, it was whatever. It was, it was nothing special. I, you know, I didn't see any like weird fusion or anything. I didn't see any restaurants like that. Maybe there's something fancy out there. Um, but, uh, <clears throat> Brazilian food, Brazilian food is good, but it's actually very, um, for the most part, it's very simple and basic. Like it's a lot of like grilled food. Um, I don't know. Do you, can you think of Carmine? What's, what's, what's a complicated Brazilian dish? Is there, is there, I think of Brazilian uh... food being kind of simple. Yeah, it is. It's, it's it's South America, so it's a lot of meat. Yeah, meat, meat, I love meat. beans, rice, rice, you know, beans. Yeah, basic yeah. shit. Brazilians like the like the French love their sweets, mm -hmm. love their sweets, and the yeah. Pastries. I want to say I want to say that their bakeries and their desserts and their drinks, like their alcoholic drinks that go along with things, are more complicated than the actual food. <laughs> you know. <laughs> um. Uh, what's your airline of choice? I mean, I, I, I don't get to fly it very often because it's super expensive, but if you've ever flown Emirates Air, man, that's a comfortable airline. That's a very comfortable airline with very, very attractive, um, uh, airline, uh, attendants, flight attendants. Um, you will never, you know, that's th th probably, probably some of the, some of the nicest, uh, nicest but you know I, I usually fly whatever's cheapest <laughs> so it doesn't really matter and when, when flying for the government you've got to fly american there's something called the fly america act and you've got to do this thing called city pairs and stuff like that so you're you know they um you, you rarely get to fly these these really nice uh nice airlines except for very short legs that, that the american carriers don't do Do you think George R. R. Martin wishes he would have done a bunch of short stories instead of a series of growing novels that have become difficult to finish? Hmm. I think that, um, I mean, I think that like George is a short story writer and I think that he's good. He's very, very good at short stories. But I think that for any writer, they're probably thinking like, oh, I need a magnum opus. I need something big. I need a book. You know, like there must be that like level and step to a writer saying that's the thing to actually finish a big book, you know. And so his books started getting longer, you know, Dying of the Light, I mean, is is practically a novella. Um Armageddon Rag's a little long, uh, Fever Dream and Armageddon Rag are, are longer, but all of a sudden, like getting to the point where you're writing a actual like book and then he goes back to short stories with wild cards, but like, um, and then to do a, a whole series, you know, I, I, I'm sure in that sense, it was something ambitious that he felt like to really be a real writer he needed to do, um, which isn't exactly like his, his wheelhouse. He's a short story writer and um i do think that's probably like interfered but you know in a sense like 
the dance with dragons and a feast for crows are more about like the short stories than it is uh even than the, the previous ones because you're constantly going to a new point of view and starting a new little short story but yeah you know what does george r martin regret i don't know i mean i'm sure he regrets like um in general how he structured a feast for crows and a dance with dragons i'm sure like had he had to do it all over again he would have not open the plot up that much or then again maybe he's like the whole reason he he opened the plot up he he got picked up and he he invented all these lore books and he made all of his money so i don't know i don't know you know people short people, stories don't pay the bills bro yeah yeah i mean he he tried to invent this whole universe with short stories with the thousand worlds and it didn't it didn't work you know you know he always he likes having he does like having this huge world of of stuff but you know it's People want these huge series to adapt. So, you know, he made his, he made his money, he made his hundred, you know, do you, do you, do you regret the choices you, you made to, to get to a hundred million dollars? Like, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Hmm. Um, the Duncan Egg stories have amazing graphic novels, adaptations, whatever George R. Martin short stories should be put in graphic novel format. Um, so the ones that exist, I know Skin Trade has been made into a graphic novel and so has In the House of the Worm. In the House of the Worm, is it's pretty good. Um, I like it a lot. Uh, the, 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 um, the artist really leaned into the fact that this was a medieval environment and um, created some really, some really creepy, wonderful stuff. I'm trying to think if anybody else. Oh, Fever Dream was made into a, a graphic novel. Um, I don't think I haven't read it. I've seen, but I've read I've read House of the War in the House of the Worm, and I've read Skin Trade. I I don't think Skin Trade's very good, just because I don't think Skin Trade's a very good story. Um, but um, but yeah, those are those are some those are some good ones. But other ones that should be, I mean, uh. I think Sand Kings was animated at some point. And I'm trying to remember song for Leah. But I think I think I would love to see I would love, love to see the glass flower as as a as a um as a graphic novel. Uh that's a that's a beautiful story with a lot of cool visuals that could be really, really well done. Um but yeah. If there's if there's any if there's any story that I think deserves it, it would be it would be the glass flower, just because you know, it, it, just a lot of different environments and a lot of different creatures that could be that could be shown in that story. But, um, all right. So Carmine, I've been on here for uh for a bit. Whoa, whoa! Hey. You can't go yet. What? Someone has challenged you what, on what, a very good challenge? point that I want to bring up to you. Addison says, I'm surprised you deal with time travel in your own book, considering you have said time travel is stupid. Mm. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, time travel is stupid. I have, um, I have my own way kind of around it. Um, that's a little different. And there's, there's a more metaphorical reason for the time travel in my book, which, which has to do with um, comparing the fact that like, in history, like people, oh, here it is. Um, oh, no, no, somebody put something up. Oh, so, um, my book deals with the fact that like people a lot of times will find something in the ground today and try to change history based on it. And in a sense, by changing the past, you're changing the present. So um, say you're dealing with like archaeology in the Middle East, which is very political. And you dig up something that says oh actually this was this area was um uh um old old you know hebrews way back in the day lived here or oh back in the day like uh uh um muslims lived here or christians lived here or this and this tribe lived here um you can then there are then like political statements about who should be living on that land today so in a sense you're time traveling right? You're, 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 you're declaring something, 
you know, it's often changing history, you know. Um, in the book, I talk about, uh, there's a chapter where we talk about like Petra. And before Petra was discovered, no one really thought about the Nebataeans very much. But now that it's like there, like you actually even talk to like Jordanians and they'll be like, they'll all of a sudden talk about their like Nebatean like identity. It's all of a sudden like part of them um, out of nowhere. So you're in a sense, you're changing the present by changing the past. And so in a sense, there's there's time travel. And so there, there's this like a uh, connection in that sense, but you'll, you'll have to see, um, have to see it's coming to coming together. So in um, short, uh, fuck off Addison. Thank you. All right. No, no. I mean, he's right, but I like, <laughs> I like time travel in my story is, is it's, it's a, it's for a metaphorical, like thematic reason that it exists. Um, and uh, so I don't know. I don't know if it works or not. You have to read it. You have to, when, when it comes out, you have to read it yourself. But, um, but time travel never makes sense. It never makes sense. It's always filled with paradoxes. So I tried, tried my best to undo the paradox as well. Um, is A Song of Ice and Fire just a grand Upside Citizens Brigade skit or what? How do you bring it all together? Please make it so. <laughs> anyway um this is the last one and then i'm signing off so uh great he, he he jokes that a great upright citizens brigade skit is the kind of like you introduce something ridiculous and then you just keep going on that ridiculousness until all of the characters just explode and there's just kind of like chaos at the end and then um then they go on to the next skit so for instance uh there's a there's an upright citizens brigade skit about little boy who the only thing he can, he, he doesn't talk, but then the only thing he says now is shut up. And so like his parents are like, oh, thank goodness he's, he's, he's talking and he's like, shut up. And they're like, okay, well, yeah, okay. That's not a nice thing to say, shut up. And then like, then they're like, you shut up. And then they all start getting angry and they start like, you know, and then it all goes off the rail as everybody gets angry because the kid is just yelling, shut up at them constantly. So, but um is a song of ice and fire that too like is it just like he's introduced all of these chaos elements like war dragons disease famine and they're just all like others and they're just all exploding at once for for what so that it can go off the rail like how can you really resolve that it's just an ultimate explosion of clusterfuck um which does seem like that's where it's going like how do you fix all of those problems at once like realistically in a plot, you know, like war, famine, war, famine, disease and supernatural magic and time travel. Like it's all just fucking cluster fucking. I'm going to throw every piece of shit at the wall all in one big thing. Yeah, that's where it's heading. Um, yeah, I agree. It's an upright citizens brigade skit. <laughs> um, anyway. Thank you very much, everyone, for sticking with me. It is late for you guys. It has been a long time for me. Thank you, Carmine, for joining me. Uh, you know, you you have all of my love. Yay. Yay. <laughs> and next time, maybe we'll eventually get on Trey the Explainer. I've been trying. He's just too busy showing off his slender body on Twitter. I'm telling him, make that OnlyFans. It's about time. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. <laughs> All right, man. Thanks, everybody. I'll talk to you guys soon.